um, let's start with this idea of generations. Because okay. just as we walked into this room, you, you saw a picture of David Bowie on right. the wall. And you said to the Sajang Nim, that's my generation. That's my generation. That's, yes. uh, and and you're, you're sensitive to generations. Now, I'm going to do something dastardly and reveal your age by s- s- telling the people that you <laughs> okay, were born in 1961, if yes, I'm correct. That's correct. Which, and I was born in 1981. So we're essentially a generation apart. Right. Um, you're quite sensitive to generations, uh, generational shifts. You've seen a lot. You've done some work on it. So perhaps let's try and start this conversation by looking into generations in general in Korea, how they're unfolding. Right, right. Well, why I'm interested in it is, I, you know, my, my, my background. Mm. Um, I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan and grew up there. And that was a big anti-Vietnam War mm. protest place in the 1960s. So mm. there was that generation, the late 60s, early 70s, the college students. And they kind of set the tone for the city that I grew up in. Mm. So that's where I kind of was interested in generations from a very young age mm-hmm. and then coming to Korea I also I, 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 I because I was born in six, 1961 mm. I'm of that 386 generation which is now 586 which yep. pretty soon will be 686 yeah. you know so I've though that generation that did the protesting and led the democracy movement in Korea those were my peers in can you Korea. give the 386 generation for those that might not know the 386 generation yeah. it's a takeoff from the old um, way of describing power of computer chips in the 1980s and 1990s so mm. 386 is people who were 30 born in the 1980s uh, people who were 30 went to college in the 1980s mm. and were born in the 1960s and that's of course, you that's me right <laughs> and then now those people are in mostly in their 50s yeah um, but in Korea, it describes that generation of student activists, people who went to college in the 80s, who went to university mm-hmm. in the 80s, and they were young. And it's a large number. You know, mm-hmm. if you look at the population pyramid of Korea, it's a large number of people. And they were young and they were in university and they, they led the democracy mm-hmm. movement, yeah. which achieved its goal in 1987. Much like, say, the generation of older hippies in Ann Arbor, where I grew up, <laughs> led the anti-war movement mm. in the U.S. So mm. um, I became interested in that from, you know, in generations from that personal background. But in Korea, the situation is kind of interesting because before the 386 generation, you mm. had a generation that was grew up during the economic boom in the 60s and 70s, and, but that was a dictatorship, mm. Park Chung-hee's time. Mm. So 1979, Park Chung-hee was assassinated, then Chun doo wan came in, and the Gwangju massacre was in 1980. Mm. So you had this change from a very strict di- dictatorship and then another dictatorship that the students decided they didn't want, mm-hmm. right? So that where you had the push for democracy because it had been denied after Park's assassination in 1979. So that, before the 386 generation, were older Koreans who knew dictatorship, Mm -hmm. but they also grew up in more poverty. Mm. You know, so it was a, and the, 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 the early years of the economic boom. So it was, they're very different from the 386 generation. Yes. And then after the 386 generation, what do we have? Well, we have... Um, 30s and 40s, people, younger people, and mm. I, I've named them, this is totally a Fauser invention, I've named them the lifestyle generation. <laughs> um, because lifestyle is sort of a key word in Korean yeah. urbanism now, you yeah. know, brand new lifestyle, you know, this kind of stuff. So I've, in other words, they're very different from the 386 generation mm. because they grew up in wealth. Yeah. Um, Korea was a developed country by the time, and they grew up in democracy. So mm-hmm. they don't know what a dictatorship is. Mm-hmm. They don't know poverty. They don't know the problems that the older generations have experienced. Um, so there's this really three layers of sort of the older generation that's yeah. grew up in dictatorship and more poverty than the 386 generation, a little bit wealthier. Yeah. But they fought Chun Doo-hwan and pushed democratization. And then the younger generation that is wealthier and 
I might put myself in this younger generation. Yeah. I, I believe technically I'm a millennial, though many would not believe you're just me. Just about just, a just millennial. About. Yes, yes. It, it doesn't sound right. And it doesn't kind of work in Korea, <laughs> and it doesn't, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, and there are different ways to look at generations. I mean, technically I'm a baby boomer, which I hate it when people call me a baby boomer because you I ba- identify. You have a baby face, just I for anybody a, listening. <laughs> <laughs> I identify with Generation X because they were the people, you know, it's like the boomers like mm. what? The door? and those kind of things yeah. but if you're like the clash and david bowie you're mm. generation x so. you're, you're ann arbor so i mean i <laughs> i i really used to listen to loads of stooges and mc5 and yeah, that kind of thing that was yeah. that was really big for me i i want to ask uh, about these generations right um, am i allowed to call you bob hmm? yeah yep bob. um yep. Th- there's two questions about this and uh the first is with this 386 generation that you described as being sort of a uh, a large group, right? The the group that was disillusioned with the return of dictatorship with Chan Doo Wan and, and worked very hard to overthrow that and bring democracy right. to to the country. The first question about it is: you didn't mention any sort of political leanings. Is it correct to call the three eight six like a leftist group, or does it transcend it and it's more national? And then the second part I'd like you to think right, about, maybe okay. while you think about this, is are we getting a little bit Marxist here in that the economic conditions affect the values and behaviors of the people? And that these three generations, they're all different, not because of human nature, but because of the economic right. conditions in which they grow up. So are the 386 leftists or... Well, leftist is kind of a loaded word, yeah, yeah, um, okay. because, you know, because in, in the Korean context, it's hard to... Yeah, it's a bit of a loaded word. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say they are more left-leaning <laughs> okay. but the, rather than leftist. Mm. Um, the core of the activists in mm. the 1980s, the democracy activists, were quite left-wing. You mm-hmm. know, and uh, so They were influenced by Marxism and that philosophy, and they also had a very nationalistic view, so their view was, but not necessarily nationalistic in the Park Chung-hee sense or that sense, but nationalistic in terms of the idea of liberation from foreign powers, Mm. and of course that put into question South Korea's relationship with the United States, Mm -hmm. which they viewed as an unequal relationship, so there was a lot of criticism of the you know relationship with the United States mm. and that then brings in North Korea and uh, reached the idea of reaching out to North Korea and eventual reunification because reunification means you're freeing Korea of foreign influence that's keeping the country divided yep. so there was a, na- a mix of nationalism and left wing ideas mm. but to you know to call everybody in that generation a marxist or a leftist yeah. is a bit you know so um a bit of a pull push but yeah that that is uh, and that came of course how did they get that way and that mm. came you know through the development a lot of them went to college and they read books so and that was something that chun doo hwan did in 1981 he expanded the number of college students so the number of college students you know, almost doubled or, you know, suddenly increased mm. in 1981. So you had more people going to, going to college suddenly. So they were reading books and they mm. were exchanging information. So you did have a, a flowering of critical thought about what was going on in Korea at the time. Was there a lot of banning of books still in the oh, 80s? Yeah. I remember in hearing the 80s, about E.H. Carr's books being banned, being banned and things. And so. Yes, yes. Um, their books were banned and... Um, even in, say, Jongno, Iga, which was the student, you know, neighborhood in the 1980s, um, mm-hmm. I remember walking with Korean friends, mm-hmm. and they would have, they didn't have backpacks at the time, they carried sort of like, um, you know, uh, briefcases or those kind of, you know, <laughs> things you carry, you sort yeah. of leather briefcases yeah, yeah, were yeah. popular, yeah. and when you would come up from the stairs, um, the police would want to open your bag. Oh, wow. And they never asked me because I was a foreigner and yeah. I didn't often carry that kind of briefcase. I used to backpack, but <laughs> still there was, you know, the, the police would open your bag, would open yeah. their bags. So it was, they were looking for books or, wow. some, you know, they were looking for things, not necessarily books, but they were, you know, it was not a democracy like it is, is now. It's amazing to think of the power of books. Yeah, yeah. And um, books were banned and... Um, Hanguk Minjung Sa was a book, the the People's History of Korea, okay. and that was banned, and then later allowed to be printed. So there were a number of books that were banned, and anything about Kwangju or anything mm. about 
related to the to you know Kwangju related uh, Japanese reports or Japanese reports about Kwangju were all banned and you know so there was a really heavy censorship. You said the book was Hanguk Minjungsa. Hanguk Minjungsa. Do you have yeah. any idea why that was banned? Was well, it, was it? because it was a you know a Marxist interpretation um, of Korean history and mm. very critical of the government and questioning the division of the country mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. blame you know uh, uh, saying that the division of the country was foreign influence and that you know for, but from a very critical point of view nowadays it would be just read as a book and people wouldn't you know bat yeah. an eye yeah. but at the time it was considered this you know very racy dangerous thing so now they even uh, pop stars will talk about post colonialism oh, yeah. and, uh, and I mean, things nowadays, like this you know yeah. right so you're talking about a different time, but um, mm. yeah. No, that's uh, it, it's wonderful to see how education plays such a big role. Yes, because yes. what I've noticed whenever I do look at uh, the Korean democratic movement, the Korean feminist movement, the Korean LGBT movement, right? It you you have this idea you have this idea before you start that it would come from the bottom up, from the sort of the earth people and things like this, but very often it comes from highly educated liberal people at universities, right, right, where they're getting the education, they're getting the knowledge, and they they have their material condition somewhat satiated, and right, then they start right. thinking about these abstract ideas of justice, equality, and it's, it's amazing how liberating education can be for right. people. Yes, and that was one thing that, you know, was going on in the 80s, because there were so many more college students, and college students were banned from doing private tutoring then as well, so... A lot of them really didn't have a lot to do. They mm -hmm. couldn't. But it, later in the 1980s, when that ban was lifted, mm. students started working, you know, doing private tutoring. And so they became busy and they had their own money. And it was, uh, you know, you could see the sort of activism starting to taper off and democratization had started by 1980, you know, mm. was starting in 1987. So the later 1980s, things started to taper off. But the early 1980s, you know, the students couldn't work. Yeah. I mean, they could. You know, so it was... That was a. There was a lot of lot of different factors came together where that was supporting this movement of uh, students um, and I, and also religious organizations, churches. Uh, you had um, liberation theology coming into Korea. And, explain uh, explain the role of the liberation theology or the the churches in this. Well, please? a lot of churches. Uh, liberation theology is the idea of. Um, you know that the theology is to serve the uh, Christianity is for the poor mm -hmm. is about the poor yeah. and yeah. so if the poor are in a bad condition then Christianity should help the poor and talk about the poor mm -hmm. and and aim for their liberation so this uh, the connection of economics and the, uh, Christianity in mm -hmm. some churches mm -hmm. and Catholics were also active in the Catholic uh, community was active in democratization movements. So you had some, some of that coming together mm -hmm. with the students. So it wasn't just the students, but the students were the force, yeah. the power behind it all. What were these people like? Because you you went to school alongside I some went to school. of them. I mean, uh, yeah, many drinking, par you know, many, yeah. what, makkali sessions <clears throat> with people. And um, it, they were all, you know, wonderful people and still are. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was they were motivated to... Uh, be politically active. When I taught at Kode in the nineteen, I taught at Kode in nineteen eighty eight. Mm -hmm. um, I started teaching there in eighty eight, and then taught there until ninety two. But mm. right at the end, yeah. the, there was an activist student who suddenly disappeared, and you know he was protesting or doing his student activities and mm. disappeared. And you know I just was like, well, he's gone, so he's going to fail the class. What I got to be, you know, you. If they don't appear and don't do any work. Oh, wow. And right near the end, just as I was doing the grades, he came yeah. to my office and he said, please fail me. And I said, well, that was my plan anyway, because, <laughs> you know, he, he didn't. Yeah, he, he wanted to make sure that he failed because his activism was more important than getting the credits for the class. So there were students like that. And then there were students who were arrested, who disappeared suddenly. You know, you had. So for a lot of students, this activism mm. I mean, they were just like any other student, right? Mm. But 
they had this activism, which was a very high priority in their lives. They were just like every other student, because when you, you I mean, as a you student, talked right? about Ann Arbor and things right. like this, we sometimes, whether it might be the, the the hippies or the or the mods or the rockers, different different people have these different aesthetic things that you right. can pinpoint. I remember reading at one point about Bul Tong Seng, Blue Jeans Tong Guitar Seng Mekju. Right, that these were right. the demarcations, the blue jeans, the acoustic guitar and the draft beer was kind of I'm just trying to bring these people to life. So you couldn't pick them out of a crowd in, in some really, way. Really? Yes. Wow. I mean, you could some in some cases, <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, but, you know, they were just like was, they didn't have a fashion. In other words, that right. was not the point right. to them. The point was to protest and make themselves heard and push the democracy movement. It wasn't a fashion thing. Mm. So that's where it's different from that kind of thing. Or the hippies, or even certain political movements nowadays where it's more like a fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That wasn't just very, you know, that that element was not so strong. Mm -hmm. It was contents. Yeah. Um, Occasionally, you know, you would get, say, a student who would do the drumming, the Samul Nori kind of drum practice, and a lot of them were student activists. Okay. And they would wear the sort of Nong Minot, the the farmer's, you know, outfit to class. What what does that, what does the the Nong Minot look like? It's a sort of a white hanbok and, you know, that kind of Mm. farmer's, traditional farmer's outfit. And then, but they were doing that not as a statement or not to show their identity as a radical student. They were just Mm. doing it too, because they were going to practice after the class. Mm. Um, Red headbands. Am I getting this wrong? Is this a different generation? You know what I mean? I can can see them, but. That's part of it. And the red handbands are, you know, part of the labor movement more, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and that, that grew up, of course, with the democratization. As soon as there was democratization in 1987, strikes and labor movements and a lot of red headbands and um, but the same people would take them off after the demonstration or something so the, yeah it's kind of interesting that it yeah. was more of a content thing not a lifestyle choice as much it was a sort of this is my personal choice I'm making and I'm into this as an idea mm. not as a a show yeah not as a cosplay or performative right. but there's something and it's it's the nation itself that they're thinking about their right. country which yeah. they've been fighting yeah. for it's, yeah. it's a lovely idea does it feel different to inha- inhabit a non-democracy because I've never done it this is the, right. the millennial oh, can in me can we get me. the aircon off that's yeah that's a good idea <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, maybe we will <laughs> repeat that again. We'll, we'll, we'll turn off the yeah. aircon and we can work out what it's like to inhabit a non-aircon room. room for a while. I, I've never mean. lived in a non-democracy. Yeah, well... Th- th- Does it feel different? It feels a little... It feels different. I mean, okay. but I was a foreigner and an American to boot. And, you know, now yeah. in, in today's language, a white man. So, yeah. you know, I was, a, in a sense, an honored guest in the 1980s. As, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I was not subject to those restrictions. I mean, mm-hmm. So I can't really say from a Korean point of view or right. that perspective. Um, but you did have, yes, I mean, people, you had to be careful what you said. Um, you had to be careful, you know, you couldn't run around. So, for example, in jong I remember going to a cafe with a American friend, Canadian friend, mm. and we went to a cafe and we were talking and people heard us speaking English and a Korean student came over and wanted to chit chat that was very common in the 1980s okay how are you where are you from chit chat and then but he he later said he wanted to go outside and talk because he had something to tell us Mm. and okay and we were ready to leave anyway you know and then it's um kind of had to keep going we he wanted to take us somewhere and it was kind of you know korea was safe it's still very safe so yeah Yeah. we'll follow you we'll go where you want to go and he kind of took us to this place where there weren't many people and then just asked a question do you know who kim dae-jung is and my canadian friend and i said oh sure you know right we we know who kim dae-jung is but he didn't want to ask that question in a public place oh wow that was 1983 oh wow kim dae-jung later became president of course yeah so you know you didn't run very soon you got kind of by osmosis you picked up well maybe you don't run around talking about you know Kim Dae-jung or you don't use the word North Korea everywhere Mm. or you know and of course English is easier to hide that but if you're learning Korean like I I was learning Korean at the time Mm -hmm. 
So I wouldn't run around saying bukan, bukan, bukan all the time. You know? mm. So um, kind of a self-censorship about yeah. what, because you don't want to make an inconvenient situation for, you know, Koreans who you're meeting. So That's fascinating that even yeah. the name would be explosive, the name, like whispered yeah. the, the Kim and, Dae-jung or something like that. Right, yeah. And um, then to and Maybe he was paranoid, but then it, his being so. paranoid is also part of the story, right? Yeah. Multiple attempts at his life that were, as far as I understand, you know, he was he was going to be thrown off a boat on the way back from Japan, I and that believe. Was, yeah, and then he was, I think, in how, under house arrest in 1982. So mm-hmm. if that conversation took place in fall of 1983, it's yeah. another, you know, yeah, yeah, Kim Dae-jung was a red flag. Yeah. And he later became president. Amazing, so, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's fantastic. Did you get any of the the other side? Because there were... I forget when it was, mm. but there were sit-ins at the American Council building, or things like this. You will know the details a little bit better. Right. Than me, but that's the same era. That's the same era. That happened a little before, a little bit before I came to Korea. Okay. Um, now I think that was 1982. I came to Korea to study in 1983. Mm. But yes, there was an anti-American. But it's you would call it anti-American, but mm. I don't really know if it's anti-American. More of a critical. Yeah. Um, stance to the United States, not anti-American. You right, know, right, right. Uh, critical stance was mm-hmm. very pro- you know prevalent among college students at the time, mm-hmm. and people would be open and they wanted to know my opinion. And I didn't like Reagan at the time, <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, okay, yeah, U.S. foreign policy sucks. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was like, they were sort of telling me things that I are had already knew or understood or sympathized with. Yeah. Um, so, but there was an interest in reaching out to hear what an American thinks about things. So that, Mm. but that was also in an interesting way, talking about it, um, was a way of bonding with people. Yeah. I mean, I didn't bring it up, you know, usually because, you know, that's, you gotta be careful. Mm -hmm. But when Koreans would ask me and, or say things about the United States and we would talk about it, that was kind of a bonding experience too. Mm. So I was never defensive or angry or offended or. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I'm British. We talk a lot about America's yeah. foreign policy. You know, yeah, and, <laughs> especially yeah, during we were the dealing with the, like this, this, you know, Central America, Nicaragua, the yeah. Contras, Iran, you know, all this stuff. So I mm. was critical, and so to, to me, Korea was another example of certain things that I was yeah. critical of at the time. I this is a little bit of a tangent, but. Two days ago, I was watching, it came up on my algorithm, it was Ronald Reagan giving a speech, and it was just a month after he was shot. Ah, And yes. I believe he was giving the speech in Berlin, and as he was speaking, <clears throat> right. a, a balloon pops. You know, it creates this loud bang while he's giving right. his speech, and he just pauses, he looks up, and he says, you missed me, and then he continues. <laughs> you, just, you could tell he was an actor because the delivery of it was, was. just was just exquisite. Yes. It was yes. really good. Yeah. Um, I just would just to unpack this That's interesting, 80s yeah. a little bit more, and then I want to con- con- contrast it, I think, with the present or maybe compare oh, it. Oh, right. That's good. But yeah. Can you take us into the, the campus, into the classrooms and, uh, and things like this? Because you mentioned that, because I knew about this, and I'm glad you brought it up, Chunduwan, there were no academies there. There was this kind of attempt at egalitarianizing the educational playing field wasn't there to, so there was no academies or hagwons or institutes it was there were some but they there, there were the english you know academies but there were no students were not allowed to go to to hagwon for exam preparation wow yeah so there was an attempt to kind of egalitarianize or some people said it was because Chen Duhuan wanted to help his kids to you know, get into college. But, you know, there was, anyway, it was a, there was no private tutoring. That was prohibited. So illegal private tutoring, you would have people wearing masks and dressing up and hiding and sneaking into apartments. It did happen. Mm. And, of course, the college entrance exam preparation, you know, those kind of hagwons weren't allowed to, you know, operate. So hagwons were just for other things. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the entrance exam was different from the one that is that exists now. So the one exi- that exists now, the Sunung, mm. is started in 1993. So before that, it was a more conservative, longer sort of subject-based entrance exam, a little mm-hmm. bit more difficult, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there was 
it was a different system at the time. It's amazing to think that something that is so synonymous with Korea, this education, this focus on late nights and studying, right, is relatively new. That it wasn't there in the eighties. This is what I'm well, trying it was, to. Get. It was it was banned in the eighties, but it was there in the seventies and the sixties and before. Mm. Of course, there were fewer college students because there were fewer places. Okay. And you go back to the sixties, the country wasn't as wealthy, so you know, you it's a different world. But it was ch- during Chun Ju Hwan's time. That's when it was banned. So it was that, that rather short time. You were at Seoul National University. And, yes, back to the, or? I was in Seoul National University, eighty three to eighty four, studying Korean. What was uh, the What was the campus like? What was it? Well, what the was campus your Korean was in, teacher. Like? Yeah, a Korean teacher was. Um, she had taught U.S. diplomats mm-hmm. when she was in Washington. I don't know how she was in Washington, but she'd come back to Korea mm. and she was teaching at Seoul National. She was a wonderful teacher. So the teachers were good and we had this old fashioned language lab with a you know, putting on a thing and hearing all the beautiful pronunciation and <laughs> that was in the morning, do that. That was optional and then we had the grammar based textbook for four hours, I think about four or five hours the rest of the day. Um, but there were times where there was one time I remember where there was this a very serious demonstration and they pulled the curtains and they put the foreign students in a room and kind of kept us there after class. Mm-hmm. So we were we weren't we were kind of like mm, like we want to go home like what's yeah. going on and the, but we the cl- curtains were closed we couldn't look out and they brought food or you know snacks and then we were allowed to go home at about five o'clock. And there was the smell of the gas, you know, chittertan, the, the tear gas. Okay. You could smell that left in the air. So there was a very serious demonstration that had happened that they didn't want us to see. It was 1983. Yeah. Um, so, and there were, you would see evidence of police coming into the school um, and then police going into the classrooms, not our classrooms, but mm-hmm. you could, you would see these riot police going in or police Mm-hmm. walking around and going into the classrooms and things. And that stopped around 1985, 86. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't at Seoul National at the time, but mm-hmm. things had started to loosen up a bit. Um, but 83, 84, police would come right into the campus. And they would sometimes search for student leaders or stand in the back of the classroom. And, you know, it was really intimidating stuff. Mm. Did you ever yeah. think... What the hell am I doing here? Like they're checking briefcases. You had a backpack, but they're coming onto campuses. Uh, did you ever not think this is a well? It's not it's Kansas not, anymore. Yeah, <laughs> Arbor, it's sorry. not a funny. It's not a. Yeah. I didn't because people around me mm. were so critical of it, mm. and people were involved in the democratization that. Strangely, I had this idea, well, it's only a matter of time. Mm. Um, that was so I kind of stuck with it. I didn't give up saying, yeah. oh, this place is a eternal dictatorship and I, I want to, you know, I want to be free, that kind of thing. I kind of stuck with it. Mm-hmm. And the more I stuck with it, the more I realized it, it's really a front. Like, you know, people are learning and people are educated and people are, there's a lot of forward looking stuff so it's going to things are going to improve sometime. Yeah. It might not be while I'm studying at Seoul National, but there was this up and coming sort of things are moving in a positive direction. Yeah, it was kind of in the air. And they despite st- the difficulties. And and they, they still are I think moving in a positive, positive direction, direction and we'll get there. And you were here as well you just mentioned from 88 to 92. So that's after the technical de- democratization of the country. Was it night and day? Was it yin and yang? Was it this sort of, they're coming onto the campus, they're checking the briefcases, we whispered names and we speak right. outside. And then in 88, it was everybody's like, Kim De Jong, North Korea, let's go. Or was it more gradual than, I, I just want to know how. Yeah, that... that's a great question. Um, and I actually thought about it on the way over here, you know, thinking about, well, you know, how, to, how do you talk about <laughs> In 87, yeah. there was the Noteu 629 declaration. Mm -hmm. Noteu was the candidate for president at the time, and Mm -hmm. he was losing support, and, you know, Chun Duhuan was a mess, and there were all these demonstrations going on. So to stop the demonstrations, um, Noteu suggested to Chun Duhuan, who agreed, Mm because he had no other choice, really, um, that the country allow a presidential election and XYZ, you know, democracy Mm. 
uh, free press, lack of end of censorship, this kind of thing. Mm. So that was a pretty stark um, change. Mm-hmm. Um, you did suddenly you suddenly had free press. Um, the Hungary started publishing in 1988. Um, wow. There were magazines that had been banned, like Mal, which was a left leaning critical anti-government magazine that was underground and that suddenly came to the surface and so it was that part the the media the control the censorship of the media was quite you know you noticed it by a couple weeks or months Hungary is 88 it, it, it didn't predate that no Hungary is wow. 88 I, yeah first time I'm hearing that right so Hungary is 88 so mm. it was pretty quick mm-hmm. um, and then you had uh, books. So the, it was this uh, that that happened in the end of June mm-hmm. in 1987, and then you had a series of announcements of these books are no longer banned. This is uh, private tutoring is allowed. Foreign travel is allowed. Mm-hmm. 89. Yeah. You can. It was hard to leave the country just to, to travel around. You know. So that's where you suddenly had. So there was a series of these positive. You know, this is liberalizing. This is opening up. This is changing. Um, it was quite, quite quick. Wow. Yeah. It must have made such a big difference. Uh, I guess curfews would have ended. Curfews during the 80s ended as well. in 1982 before oh, okay. I got That's here. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, that was not an issue. But all, a lot of things started to change quite quickly. Yeah. But does that mean democracy is taking root? It took a little. It, it, the election was held in eighty eight, mm-hmm. and that was a very uh, eighty seven. Sorry, the uh, election was held in December eighty seven. Kim Dae Jung, Kim Yong Sam, No Tae Kim Jong Pil, the as big well. four. Yeah, and um, Kim No Tae won, of course. Um, which, <laughs> of course, and yeah, well, <laughs> you know, that's what people, you know, if you look at it, the two Kims having split the vote. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was you know, a lot of people were sad about that, and but was it, what was interesting as far as democracy is Kim Dae Jung and Kim Yong Sam did not accept the results of that election. Did they not? They did not. Kim Jong Pil did, and Kim Jong Pil no. sent a you know flowers to Noteu, congratulations on winning. Mm-hmm. But the other two did not. Much like say Trump didn't accept the results of the mm. 20, 2020 election. Um, sure. but, Go on. but then Please. you know. People kind of what they didn't, and there were he had both of them had very you know solid support and very yeah. passionate supporters. Particularly Kim Dae Jung had very passionate supporters, but they didn't accept the results of the election. But the people, sort of the mass of people, were kind of tired of it, mm-hmm. and they it, it, you know No Two won by 36%, the others got 27, 26, something like that. Mm. So the atmosphere was, it's kind of over. Mm-hmm. And so everything kind of quieted down. Mm. And then in 1988, they had an election for National Assembly, mm-hmm. and the ruling party that No Two was a member of was beaten solidly because, and you know, I was in Tejan teaching at Keist at the time. Wow. You know, and that was early 88. And, uh, you know, one of the office workers said very clearly, well, we have to contr- we have to limit the power of the president, you know, which is a very interesting and the very logical and very rational way of looking mm-hmm. at it. Yeah. So no, they got no Teu. Nobody really liked him except the 36 percent who voted for him. But then they l- kind of, they limited the power of the president in the next National Assembly. So you had a kind of. Uh, uh, that that showed um, to me, uh, um, you know, awareness of how democracy works. Mm-hmm. It yeah. was quite interesting. They were suave. They knew what was going yeah, on. And yeah. <clears throat> um, as you talk about these numbers, I believe it was in one of your pieces that I read yesterday that said, since democratization, Park Geun-hye was the only person to win more than 50% of the vote. I think so. And yes. I looked at that and I was like, yes. wow, that's yeah. a... Hockey and then, was the only one. And then yeah. to drop down to about 4% just as, as she left office. Right, yeah. Just, just while we're staying in this, because I didn't expect to get this political, by the way, but here we are. Here we are, <laughs> yeah. Here we I, are. I, I haven't talked about it in a long time. Yeah. You know, just, yeah. But it, it's fascinating <clears throat> to me because it's, it's people that lived it and experienced it rather than just books. Could you perhaps, do you have anything to say about Kim Jong-pil? I, I know him as, like, the label is the kingmaker or something like this. Right. Was, whereas Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-sam... 
in the other order both eventually became presidents and, the, and right. they will come up in students' textbooks and history books a lot more. Kim Jong-pil is very important but sometimes under-discussed Yes, gentleman. and actually Kim Jong-pil is kind of interesting because I went to Buyo. I got back from Buyo just yesterday. What's and the that, connection there? Well, he, was, he, was, he uh, is from... A place right next to Buyo. Okay, I so he's a yes. uh, Chungcheong Namdo guy, mm. and that of course mm. is he used that as his base mm. and was able to use the votes of Chungcheong Namdo Teja in that area mm. to you know negotiate a position first in Kim Yong Sam's government and Kim Dae Jung's government. So he was able to use his vote cat, you know, kingmaker that kind of thing. Mm. But he's able to bring votes to both sides. Um, so his role was, and yes, kind of a kingmaker for the, you know, Kim Yong Sam and then Kim Dae Jung, but he started his career mm. under Park Chung Hee in the nineteen mm-hmm. sixties, and he was one of the, you know, he, I think he was the prime minister under Park Chung Hee for a while, and I mean he was involved in the normalization of relations with Japan and a lot of the early industrialization policies and things, so. He had a long political career mm. as a, sort of a supporter of another person. Mm-hmm. Say, you know, supporting Park Chung Hee and then later supporting uh, Kim Yong Sam. And but in that under in, after democratization, his support was bringing in the votes. Yeah, yeah, keeps you out of the trouble if you're always the supporting person. You're less likely you to be assassinated the, or put yes, in jail. Yeah, he yeah. did. Am I getting it wrong? Did he not? Was he not? Related to Park Chung Hee through marriage was there I think not he a, was, his, his yeah. sister like, I don't or know wife? The detail or, his yeah. his wife may have been related to the, the way you said there that Kim Jong Pil had a base around where would you say Daejeon Chung Chung Namdo yeah, yeah particularly Buyo was his where he's from but the whole Chung Chung Namdo and Daejeon was part of Chung Chung Namdo for a long time too. <laughs> It almost sounds less ideological and more Diokdui, this kind of regionalism, because Kim Dae Jung obviously had a right. huge support yeah. from his region. So it's it I, is it tr- it's less so much about ideology or thoughts, but where you're from. And so I oh I, yes, I yes. see it as like but, little fiefdoms or or what's the word like admirals coming from their different things with their tribes bringing people together. Right. It's very three kingdoms rather right. than. Democracy at the time, yes, that was what it. You know, the the regionalism was a big motivating factor in how people voted. Yeah, oh, wow. It, it isn't as much anymore. Yeah. It's still there, but it also is in other countries as well. You know, it's not just a Korean thing. But um, at the time, regionalism was a big thing. Yeah. yeah, bigger than it is now, and you know that's something that the the process of democratization has reduced the role of that, mm-hmm. and, and things are more ideological now. Yeah. Which is, you know, makes sense. You seem very, uh, forgive me if I'm uh, misattributing your comfort, but you seem very comfortable in modern Korea. Uh, right see, now, yes. We, so, we, yeah. With young people and with, with culture yeah, and values and yeah. with newspapers and things yes. like this. So is there a, we've, we've talked a little bit about that generation, the 386 and right. the 80s and things like that. Shall we, shall we contrast it with what we see today? Right. R- rather than leave that to the end, let's let's right. put them put them right kind of next a to each other because I I spend every week I interact with a, a couple of hundred, close to three hundred, you know, university students right, across right. two universities, and they're they're smart, they're polite, they're they're pretty punctual, they're they're, they're generally very moral right, people. Right. Right. Yes. They're, they're not walking into class stoned or with bad attitudes or anything right, like this. Right. Right. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that it's – I have a lot of hope for this generation. I, I hope they'll do well. But I haven't experienced the previous generation as much perhaps. Okay, yeah. It, it, it kind of to get into that, it's – it's a lot of people like to – you know, they think somehow I, you, the generation you're a member of is mm. somehow the norm. Mm. And so – Generations above and below are sort of not the norm. <laughs> that I don't look at things that way because right. that that's a foolish way to look at things because Agreed. everything changes and you know younger people are going to do things differently from uh, you know me my generation or mm-hmm. our, our generation simply because I mean, that that's just progress or change which mm-hmm. is normal. Um, I think one of the interesting things from a slightly critical point of view, looking at younger people today mm-hmm. compared to the 386 generation is 
the 386 generation, a lot of people had this a sense of agency, a sense of I want to do something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do this, mm. even though it was a dictatorship and there was a strong sense of I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, I'm an owner of my life. Is the Marxism coming back out again? <laughs> um, and that that kind of thing was in yeah. that that also rolled into the IT because the if you look at the 386 generation as they got older they mm. were the ones who were big into the startup stuff in the 1990s mm. right so you had so they the 386 generation weren't a, they didn't keep protesting for the rest of their lives they evolved into this IT generation mm -hmm. and, you know the first startup generation in the 1990s that gave us things like the oh you know cable modem Right. Mm -hmm. I first discovered that in Korea because, you know, the U.S. and Japan had dial-up modems. <laughs> uh, you know, so there were a lot of interesting startups that were got funded around the after the IMF, the IT mm -hmm. stuff that, um, you know, made its way. So that generation had this sense of, oh, I'm going to start a business. Or I'm going to do this. And that it's a little bit different with younger people where they younger people today in Korea are much like, say, younger people in other countries where it's. You, you want to find a track within the system and go with it. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's where they worry about their careers or starting a career rather than the idea of I'm going to do something, what I, I'm going to do what I want or mm -hmm. start a business or do this. It's finding a track within the system. Mm. So what's, it's a li that's a little bit of a difference. Uh, so I'm going to ask you what's brought about that change. As you talk about these startups, I uh, Noam Hyun was the first internet president, I believe, as I well. He's yeah. often called that, yes, even before yes. Obama would utilize oh, those techniques. Like for sure, yeah. Uh, over here, they were very savvy to that. Now, you've mentioned this idea of the people of the past charting their own path, sort of going off piste, <clears> off the beaten <throat> right, track, right. and you know, clearing the debris and, and going off into the unknown, whereas today, perhaps people are a little bit more inclined. They maybe nihilistic is not the word but they you know the system doesn't change and so you find a path in the system right i, I think that's a rather astute observation do, do we know why that is or do you um, have a sense an inkling yeah i i one way to look at it is uh, this conversation came up yesterday when i was complaining to korean friends that i was meeting for dinner about Trump, you know, that's what I do. You know, I, I, you know, maybe I bore them with it, but you got to get it out because it's just such a mess. Um, so, you know, get your Trump explosion for five minutes. and We do Boris Johnson where I'm from. It's okay. Boris yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what it's like. We got it covered. So, um, but then, you know, interesting, then of course, Yoon Seo Gyal comes up, but one of the Korean friends I was with said quite interested, you know, well, Yoon Seo Gyal is a problem, he said, but now Korea has a system. Mm -hmm. meaning that the impact of the president is much less than it would have been, say, before. Mm. And so I think part of the way to look at things is, you know, there are the companies are more organized, perhaps, or there's more of a system in place, say, mm. compared to the 1980s. I mean, if you're thinking about a transition from a dictatorship to a democracy, there's no system that's... Mm. You're, you're making a new system as you go along, and the companies were growing very fast at the time. And, you know, Samsung wasn't what it is today, right, in the mm -hmm. 1980s. So the just the advancement of a kind of system, mm -hmm. and I don't mean this in a positive way, system, but, you know, there's, there's more of an organized society. Uh, so, therefore, that's what that might be what's influencing it. Um, you were here a lot earlier than me but when i came in just about the absence of a system you would um i would walk along jong the yiga jong jong the samga that was where my hotels were uh, when i first arrived and they would sell uh illegal dvds on the street for three for man one right and right. Uh, and the police would look at them as they walk past and say i've seen that one i've not seen that one yeah. and they'd be yeah. selling watches and there was a lot more cash in hand stuff going on yes, there wasn't yes. that what i see of the system now and you're describing is there's a lot more focus on i'm not sure what the words are copyright protection legal and if you want right. to drive that car you need to have the correct license you can't just 
drive your van up from the countryside Correct, here. Yes, Everything's yes. monitored and monitored, <laughs> and um, say your private information. You have to agree where your private information. I mean, th- that of course happens in other countries. But yeah. Say if you think back to the eighties or nineties in Korea. The, these kind of things were uh, the rules and how to having a system to manage different conflicting interests mm. or things like that was not it was not in place as much as it is today. So that might mean that say young people have the idea of rather than start my own IT company, mm-hmm. uh, maybe it's better just to get a job in Samsung or somewhere else and just roll with it. Yeah. Um, so there is, and that on the is that a loss of entrepreneurship? Perhaps I don't know. That's an interesting question. Mm-hmm. The entrepreneurship, which drove a lot of progress in Korea, um, is that fading or not? I don't know. But it's so that's where then the lifestyle generation idea kicks in because some of the lifestyle generation, you know, the, the people open these coffee shops or yeah. Um, say so, even the owner of where we are now, mm-hmm. these people are sort of out of the system a little bit and doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. So it's not 100% that everybody wants to, you know, package themselves and get a job at Samsung or Hyundai or some big company. Mm-hmm. There are people who are doing creative things uh, kind of on the outside, you know, and yep. there are plenty of them. Uh, but it's different from what they would have done in the 80s. Yeah. I I, I, th- I think the owner of this place would have had a good time in the 80s. I'd love to bring him on camera one time because he has long hair and he's got about 10 guitars, yeah, 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 10 yeah, guitars you know, in I mean, that room back yeah. there. And yeah. I've not heard him play too much, but he's he, he's very much a, a rocker and part of the alternative. You you mentioned Trump. We we did Reagan and his balloon speech. <clears throat> you did mention in passing Yoon seok yeol the current right. president yes. of uh, the Republic of Korea who sang American Pie in the White House with Joe Biden. Yes. Win any brownie points in your mind for his rendition of that? Um, well, I, it was kind of I'm interesting. putting you on the spot. Sorry, I know. It, it was kind of interesting. It's, I it's saw a weird that. thing. It's a weird thing. I saw <laughs> yeah. that. And, you know, and what was so interesting is um, Biden's reaction and the reaction of the people there. I'm sure they planned it. I mean, he wasn't put on the spot. <clears throat> mm. um, but I think... Americans can't sing, you know, we don't. Not, uh, so one of my biggest difficulties when I first came to Korea in the 1980s yeah. was like sing, right? And that was in the 1980s, there was, you know, there weren't norebangs or things like that. So singing in that time meant standing up in front of a lot of people and actually singing, oh, wow. which is impossible for me to do. So Without all the reverb on uh, the norebang mic yes, and the tambourines. Yes, because with the norebang, you can, you know, you've got, you're, you're covered, right? <clears throat> mm. Yes. Um, but so that the norebang was actually a great invention because when the party would move to the singing stage, I would always suggest later, you know, go to a norebang and let's get, let's do it. And that was cover me up. But in the 80s, that didn't exist. When right? did norebang start? I think it was early it a... 90s, maybe late wow. 80s, 90s. I mean, it was. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the singing was so when he, <laughs> I saw Biden, <laughs> you know, when I saw Biden's reaction to it, I'm like, yeah, uh, Americans don't know how to sing. You're pretty surprised. Right. You know, because. He, mm-hmm. he did a pretty good job. Just but a, for a Korean, you know, most Koreans, I mean, sh- I'm sure even if you were to ask one of your students to sing. They're most on it. Most, most of them can sing. They're on it. Yeah. They learn piano from a very early piano, age. And they yeah. learn scales and they know how to jump up and down. Of, and even yes, if they're not. Yeah. So uh, Biden's reaction was like, yeah, the American who can't sing is. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas all the Koreans were like, it's just another Ajoshi. Like, it's just a, another, a, yeah. A norobang, essentially. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if, if we go back to the, just go back to the young people today, I find it interesting that a lot of focus in the international media and domestic media is right. about <clears throat> Excuse me. Their hardships, their depressions, right, their, right. their mental health, their lack of fertility, their uh, unwillingness right. to marry. Right. So many problems, and this narrative, and there are there is data to back this up, of course. But that narrative that I see, which uh, flows so quickly and easily amongst people, is not something that I always see in my lecture halls and classrooms. Right. Right. <clears throat> and I'm not sure how to I, – I, I have certain ideas on this, but when you're with young people today, when you see these narratives, do you see this 
trouble with the young people, with the gender and uh, with the fertility, or, or, or do you see more hope? Do you see a yeah, brighter? Yeah, it's that. It's, it's a hard question because whenever I see that reporting, you know, which is sort of becoming more common, unfortunately, but. Yeah. Maybe I'm offended because I have an affection for Korea, and I there there could be that emotional level. But that's we'll put that aside for a minute. Mm-hmm. I think the problem is the same thing. You could say the same thing about Japan. You could say the same thing about the U.S. or mm-hmm. a lot of other advanced countries. I don't know about non you know say middle income or you know I don't know about say the Dominican Republic. Um, maybe yeah. not or Turkey. I went to Turkey last year. I don't, you know, so, but if you think about the developed world, um, it's not, is it just a Korean problem or is it more of a generational problem or Mm -hmm. is it that the media is more aware of it and wants to write about it? Mm -hmm. Um, It could be a combination of all these different things, but I don't think it's necessarily a Korean problem. Mm -hmm. But where the difference might be um, is the birth rate, but Korea is not the only country with a low birth rate, but it is quite low compared to the other countries. Yeah. So how, what is that issue and where does that come from? And sometimes, but again, it's not unique because Italy and Spain and you know other countries have very low birth rates. And sometimes those countries have their birth rates propped up by different, different. parts of the population where you right. might get more immigrant workers right. coming, coming in or in. foreign members yeah. Uh, and, and they will um, bolster up the population, whereas the, the working middle uh, middle class, upper right. class, they, they will have fewer children, whereas Korea doesn't have necessarily that. Right. I, I'm not sure if my words are completely correct here, but they don't have that sort of foreign immigrant not population. Not to the degree of, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you think of Spain, I think Spain is like 13%. Not uh, not born in Spain, mm-hmm. so foreign born thirteen yeah. percent. Korea foreigners about two percent of the population. It's a difference, isn't it? So that's a big difference. Even though it's increased in Korea, I mean, when I was here in the eighties, the number of foreigners was. If you saw a Westerner on the street, it's like, who are you? Like, <laughs> you know, who do you know? I mean, it, so it's yeah. it has increased for sure the number yeah. of foreigners, but it's still not over ten percent or fifteen percent. I mean, Germany, I think, is sixteen percent. U.S. is about 15, around there. Most of the Western Europe and North America would be at least 10% Mm. foreign-born. So that's quite a difference from where Korea is. Um, And Korea might go that way? I don't know. Um, It's a very interesting question. Most observers would say no. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm tending to not believe in that no. I'm tending to say perhaps yes at some point. Um, but I, that that's kind of being a pre, trying to predict the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but why I'm a little more optimistic about Korea going that route is because I think if it becomes a national goal, um, mm. if somehow yeah. somewhere yeah. there's a benchmarking, I hate to use that <laughs> word, but it's a very common thing in Korea where you have a you benchmark. Yeah. And then you adopt this as a national goal because it's beneficial for the country. Mm -hmm. Um, If immigration is presented in those terms, I think most Koreans will probably accept it. Mm -hmm. Most, not all, but most. I think the young people will accept it. The the young people are very open-minded. They've grown up on Insta and TikTok and their their heroes are not always necessarily Soteji anymore no, or, or Kim Gwang Sok, but it's it's Doja Cat and it's all you know yeah. Taylor Swift and right they, they've got all of these different role models and so globalization or multiculturalism or whatever word that we put on it cosmopolitanism perhaps is almost second nature. To, it's almost second to nature to the young yeah. children today. Right. Um, so. They don't have a national. You, you mentioned this idea of national goal, and there always was one for Korea. There always was, and whether yes. that might have been to <laughs> have an empire and then to overthrow colonization and then reunification or development, modernization, democratization. Re, there has always been a national goal for Korea, and they generally achieve them. Right. Well, it, we'll just talk about South Korea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. They're, there's always been a kind of national goal and it's been achieved. And yeah. so just an example of a, it's not a national goal, but a local goal was, mm-hmm. I went to the Kwangju Biennale last week. 
Um, and I went to the first one in 1995. So I remember going to the first one, 1995, mm-hmm. and I wrote a review of it. Um, or was it 1993? Can you, you can tell me what anyway, it is again? I missed the, the Kwangju Biennale, an international art show. Okay. It uh, started in the 90s. I think the first one might have been 1993, mm-hmm. and I remember going to that, and then there was one in 1995, and I remember going to that. But at the time in the mm-hmm. 1990s, early, mm-hmm. mid-1990s, you know, what's Kwangju? All the art world, world people were like, well, nobody's going to go. It's like, it's, there wasn't a KTX then, right? So... You know, it's like way in the deep countryside. And it's, you know, what's Kwangju thinking? They're going to have an international art show. And, you know, but they wanted this as something different and unique. Mm. And the massacre was still, you know, not, it was still on people's minds mm. quite a bit as a recent history, piece, a piece of recent history. And so the city fathers or the, the government of Kwangju decide we're going to have an international art show. You know, Biennale every two years, and they yeah. wanted this big international art show. They did it, and people kind of were like, "What's that?" You know. But now it's the biggest, it's the most important international art show in Asia. And you, you went know. there last week. And I went there last week. Can you and tell me about it? It was yeah. wonderful, and you know, they have the the main hall, which yeah. is was built in the nineties for the. Is this the Kim Dae-jung Memorial Center? Oh, no, it's this is another a, place. Okay, yeah, Sorry. Um, it's another place, and. Uh, so the Kwangju Biennale Hall is where the main exhibition is held, and uh, beautifully curated, very interesting. Uh, and I walked around thinking, "Wow, this is so much better than the famous Documenta the, that's held in Kassel, Germany, which mm-hmm. I went to last year, and was kind of it was a bit of a flop. Mm-hmm. I was bored, but I saw it because you know you pay for the hotel." <laughs> So, you know, I did it. But this, you know, the Kwangju Biennale was really, it was very well curated and I enjoyed it and it's gotten good reviews, but it's now an established thing. This is the 14th one. Wow. So you have a goal Mm. and people may laugh at the goal and okay, laugh all you want, but who's laughing now, right? So, you know, this is something about Korea where you have... A goal, and the goal comes from benchmarking, but it also comes mm. from let's do it, hamyeon denda. This sort of like mm. we're going to break through the wall, or we're going to do something. Uh, I love that hamyeon uh, yeah, denda. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the Kwangju uh, Biennale is an example. There, there are many examples. But I guess Busan with its film film, festival uh, film festivals and things like is, that is as well. an example. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but even things like, uh, you know, in the 1980s, part of the uh, prep, the Olympics is another side to the 1980s, of course. But there were the preparations for the Olympics and mm-hmm. all the different things they <laughs> tried to do, which people at the time thought were a little bit silly. People were critical, you know, but they did it. Um, one thing was, I think around mid 80s, maybe 85, 86, they mm suddenly passed a law or put in, tried to put in place a regulation that all that the 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 um, kitchens at restaurants should be visible so that people could see okay for you know to see what's how their food is being cooked and feel more comfortable about the sanitation transparency, transparency. on your rice yeah <laughs> so there were these there was a time where that you could see into the kitchens of course nobody looked in right? yeah but this was something where they were really pushing to increase the sanitation at restaurants and, mm. you know so that was a big but now of course that's you know been done you know so step by step you have a goal and it's it yeah it's achieved and then the question I, I, I think would be one of the questions I have is what is Korea's goal today? Maybe there's less. There's less of that. And of so that. that is where, say, the immigration thing, if Korea really sets a goal about immigration is good for the country and we need this and mm. you build a consensus, I mm. think that it would be quite acceptable. Um, but that goal isn't there yet with that topic. No, um, no. So then, yeah, the question is the overall goal of what, yeah, what are the goals of uh, the, what goals do Koreans have now? And that's kind of an interesting question. It's harder to answer than it would be, say, in the eighties or nineties or you know even mm. the two thousands. And that might be the rise of individualism and different goals. It might also be the lack of interest in the North, which was always a big part of the eighties and nineties. I, I yes. think that sort of you know it, it might come back again with a 
excuse me, with another um, left-leaning government. Uh, if that comes into power, it might come back come again. Come back again, But at yes. the moment, it seems very far away. And for the young people I speak to, the, the, the common refrain I will always hear from them is, I would like reunification once I'm dead. Right, right. And this comes from 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds. Yes, and they're yes. like, you, you, could, you could dream all that. Well, I had to do it at school, but please just wait until I'm not here anymore because right. I don't want to do the tax and all I that. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, I, I didn't expect to talk about art with you, but you obviously have a, a deep affinity or a love for it. And a perhaps... Um, inappropriate prejudice about career would be a lack of artistic quality. This is something that gets labelled at K-pop sometimes or yes, perhaps yes. Uh, East Asian people more generally because of a focus in education on rote learning and repetition right, that right. these people, they might score high on standardised piece of testings but they, right. they will never write uh, Henry David Thoreau or something right, like this. Right. Uh, Nobel Prizes for Literature. Do you have any observation on the level of artistic quality because you, you spoke so glowingly about this Guangzhou, Guangzhou and yes. I'll get it wrong Biennale Biennale Guangzhou Biennale what is Biennale Biennale is Italian word for biennial okay thank yeah. you very much because Venice has one because Venice Biennale so uh, uh, yeah. that's what it is I like displaying my ignorance sometimes it's very <laughs> it's very embarrassing you no, know I'm meant okay. to be a professor but like uh, I'll ask the stupid <laughs> questions any any comment on this the, the level of artistic creativity here uh, yeah um <laughs> I think the 1990s were an interesting time for art in Korea because that was when the first time that Korean art kind of went overseas. Mm. Not the first, but mm. I mean, it was a, where you had younger artists, younger Korean artists going overseas or participating in exhibitions. Mm. Um, so the 1990s were the, it was the first time that Korean art got attention mm. in the West. Um, and you had Korean artists joining exhibitions overseas. And then, of course, the Kwangju Biennale started. And that was part of that movement, right, that Korea wanted to make a I impression through art. Mm. Um, but the problem with the quality argument is how do you judge quality, right? How do you judge artistic quality? And, mm. you know, how... I, I think in architecture you can make a case, but this is also true in a lot of other countries as well, that... A good architecture requires good client. In other words, mm -hmm. if you want to make good architecture, you have to have a client who has cash and who is willing to let you do what you want. <laughs> and that in the in the current world, you know, Korea or otherwise, is uh, those conditions are rarer. Mm. So perhaps in architecture you can see where the lack of freedom, but that's not a political freedom or an artistic freedom. It's mm -hmm. an economic element, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the people want to maximize their profit from the space or, yeah, there's all kinds of reasons why a Korean architect, contemporary architecture might, you might not have a star architect coming out of Korea. It's not any, say, lack of ability. It's mm -hmm. just that maybe there aren't that many clients. And that would apply also with the West. I mean, if you look at a, a U.S. city that's been gentrifying, all the buildings look exactly the same mm. because they all want to make the, certain, the, the a profit from the land, right? So you build a big box and you build another big box. And so you might – so the, a lot of the famous buildings in the United States are not they're, – they're from previous era. Mm -hmm. The Empire State Building or something like that, Rockefeller mm -hmm. Center, they're all from mm -hmm. the 1930s and when Rockefeller was spending money and yeah. wanting to make a big impact in New York or, you know, same would be the UK. Um, the, the, you know, a lot of stuff in London was done. It goes back centuries, some of the stuff in London, you look at that and I it's mean, like somebody wanted to make an impact and they spent money and made an effort. To, is it yeah. St. Paul's Cathedral where... King Charles was recently coronated in yeah. 1066. 1066. I mean, Something you know, so it's Battle of Hastings is 1066, but it's around there. It's like a, a thousand yeah. years old, some of these buildings. And you, I'm looking at and them. And they're like, royal or religious, and so there's this there, there's effort put into them, right? Um, gargoyles, like, high yeah. up in the sky, and you're looking at How did you do that How back did, in the yeah, past? Uh, yeah, so... The, this is probably a, a beautiful time to turn on to cityscapes and things like yeah. this, because... You walk around here and, and you give tours and you write books 
in Korean about cities. Yes, and uh, yes. y- you have a, you share a little bit similar, perhaps, you know, Colin Marshall? Yes. He's a fascinating chap. He does similar things like that. Um, let me give you this idea just to preface this part about cities and and what they look like, because... I've struggled to find beauty in Seoul for a while. When I look at it right. from a macro perspective, when I look out across it and I see the the uh, the apartments and things like that, when right. I'm on ground level walking around, I can right. see the beauty. Um, now, the I'm not sure of his position, but the, the academic David Matsumoto, he said that all culture is a specific solution to a specific problem. So when, right, for example, right. you get the rise of the, 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 the Hanok in previous times, the reasons that Koreans built Hanok is because that type of uh, accommodation was a solution to the problem created by the environment because of the, the cold winters, the hot summers, the wind, right, the right. rain, and the Hanok was a, a great solution for that. We don't have as many Hanoks in the modern world. Right, we have... Right what 10 million odd people trying to live inside greater Seoul right and so the solution to that is high-rise apartments apartments. let's go and so uh, the environment keeps presenting different problems uh, and people find different solutions and so what we have here at the moment is Korea trying to to get through these uh, the does the what does the city of Seoul say to you? What do we, how does it speak to you as you walk through it? Right. Well, there. I, yeah, that's it's a great question. I think there are two levels. One is the personal level because I was here and I've seen it change, yeah. and I have my memories here, and I just have associations with different places. And the other is kind of looking at it as a from an outsider. Um, Can we start with memory, please, sir? So with memory, then you know what's oh, I think it changes. To Seoul is to me still the heart of Seoul is this very small geographical area inside the four gates. Mm-hmm. So that would be, you know, let's say Sodaemun to Dongdaemun and then Bukchon down to Namdaemun, and that's kind of about it. That big sort of circle, mm. and that's known, you know, as the Sadaemun An, right? Uh, you know, so you have the inside the four gates. Um, Sadaemun An, like that An is An inside, inside. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so you have the so that to me is the heart of Seoul. Um, I'm not saying that's the only Seoul, but mm. that's the heart of Seoul to me. That's the Seoul that I knew when I first came here. Mm. Was th- that was the downtown? That was the center of Seoul. It, you can argue that it still is, but in 1980s, Gangnam had only been developed for about 10 years, right? If you think the development, the roads being laid out, and the development started in the 70s. Mm. You know, the the, the, or the, the, the uh, green line, line number two, mm. that only went to Yoksam in 1982. Oh, wow. It didn't go any further than <clears throat> Yoksam, and then it was all linked together as a big circle line in, I think, 82, 83. 83, probably. 83 was when it opened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you had the other line. So Gangnam was this very faraway place. Mm. Seoul National was like in the super boonies. So outside going of to the, the moon. Gates. Yeah, yeah, outside of the gates. On the other side of the river, and you had Gangnam emerging as the place for the new upper middle class. Mm-hmm. The new is the key word because the country, the economy was growing and people who were getting more money and, you know, moving to Seoul from other places, they were congregating in Gangnam. But that wasn't, you know, that was the early 80s. That had only started in the 70s. So... No more than 10 years old when I came here. So Gangnam mm-hmm. was still kind of not the center. Mm. And then by the 90s, you know, you had Gangnam, the Teheran No started to look like New York or Chicago. I think it looks more like Chicago, but, <laughs> you know, the, the, the skyscrapers on both sides. Yeah. And, um, you know, so you, by the 90s, Gangnam had clearly become a competing center. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you go into the 2000s and Gangnam is arguably more the center so that the emergence of Gangnam is the biggest change in the city that I've seen and mm. th- that's a big dynamic um, and so that means that the Sade Munan the, the, old, the area inside the four gates mm. it hasn't really declined I mean it's still the very commercial but it's become more touristy it's become more of a lifestyle choice. That's where you get Iksandong or Bukchon, people going there because they like the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a choice people make to go there. Yeah. It's not the traditional center of the city as much. 
Do you have any the commercial heart of the city? It's not the commercial <clears throat> heart of the city because a lot of that has moved to Gangnam. It's more of a sort of let's cosplay, let's go to a nice cafe for the afternoon, yeah. and then we'll go back, we'll to, go back to where we might be from. Right. There, there's been a great change in front of uh, in in the Gwangmun Square. Yes, and that's gone back and forth. And you know, how do you observe these changes? I mean, because this is probably right <clears throat> in the Sademunan, this in in, in the center. Uh, what do you make of these? Changing lanes of traffic and well, it's, it's fascinating because Kwangamun started out with this, the, the, you know, it was two lanes of traffic, and you mm. have the Isun Shin statue there, yeah. very national. You know, it's a Park Chung Hee object from that era, mm. and then you had the uh, rows of ginkgo trees in the middle. Yeah. And this was, you know, a parade route perhaps, yeah. and then that. Existed for a very long time, continued to you know exist for a very long time, and then you had the idea of changing it into a park <laughs> with traffic on both sides. And but of course the problem with that is there weren't many trees, and it was you know a bit um, hard to get. You know you had to go across the street on both sides. Mm. So mm-hmm. they wanted to add, uh, redo it, and in redoing it, they added more trees. So. It's interesting that you know the redo the, the redoing of Kwangamun, mm-hmm. uh, the new Kwangamun that has it has many more trees. So that reflects an idea which is still very prominent in Seoul: is the idea of bringing in more greenery. Yeah, I applaud it because it's I'm concrete jungle. That's what Korean city planners are what people probably think there's just too much concrete so we need to bring in the green and that goes back to Cheonggyecheon and that that's the first big project mm-hmm. but another one is the Kyungwi Soup uh, Park Kyungwi Sun yeah. Kyungwi Sun Soup the Kyungwi Sun Forest Park mm-hmm. that you know you can walk all the way from Samgakji all the way to where we are now yeah it's a spectacular walk yeah um, and there's another one in the northern part of the city and they're they're all around Mm-hmm. So you know the the the, the idea of green bringing in greenery or making places that weren't green green. Mm-hmm. I mean the railroad tracks probably didn't have any trees, <laughs> but when they got rid of the railroad or put it underground, then they yeah. had this space and they turned it into a park. So that that's an interesting change. And Do you think it, it's, it's helping? I, I I agree with you, and you've raised this question in my mind. Do you think it's fair to say that Korean people like walking in the evening? I see lots of oh, uh, yeah, on these yeah. paths. Like um, we have them. I'm I'm out by um, Yuksa by the military academy in the northeast. Oh, uh, okay. By, uh, so you know where that other walk is. It kind of connects to Yuksa and goes to yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> right. But, but there's these big long, <clears throat> excuse me, walking paths that they they're building up and. When I don't have the time, I'll go running in the evening. And, right, and, right. But I see so many people out oh, the, walking. Yes, yes, there's families and there's old people, people and young and, people. And, yeah, but it's it, it's very uh, people get outside. They get outside, yeah, and, and they walk along these paths. Right, right. Well, I think an interesting thing is um, how to look at that. Is it's if you think of people in a city, mm. or say, what do people do in a city? So if you land yourself in New York and Mm -hmm. you sit around and talk to New Yorkers, some art exhibition talk will probably come up. Like, have you seen this art exhibition? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that art exhibition? So going to an art gallery is a New York thing. Okay. Um, Going to this restaurant, that restaurant is a New York thing. Mm -hmm. It's not so much a soul thing. Like when I get together with Koreans, I I might talk about uh, seeing an art exhibition, Mm -hmm. but walking is a soul thing. So, and even food, you know, it's uh, and talking about restaurants. I mean, mm. perhaps, but not like the New Yorkers as much or, you, you know, you're my image of New York or when I go to New York. Mm. Um, so I think walking is really a big thing. Koreans might talk about cafes, more, mm-hmm. perhaps. Um, but with the walking, do you... Th- so the walking is a big part of life in Seoul. Is, yeah. Does safety play a role in that? Because Seoul's, I, I'm not sure your take on it. Seoul seems to me a pretty safe place to walk around. Safety is part of it. Um, I think lifestyle. I think a lot of Korea, you know, middle-aged Koreans view it as healthy. Um, I think. And then there's the outdoor. I mean, I had to buy something. I had to buy a backpack. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ended up at the Hyundai department store in Shincheon about a week ago. Mm. And 
you know, where do you buy a backpack? And I ended up in the outdoor floor. Like, there's a whole floor for outdoor clothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's North a category. North Face and everything. North yeah, Face and all of it and, you know, poles <clears throat> and the whole – that's a category. Yeah. So that means people are spending money on that to go mountain climbing or mm-hmm. even, you know, the hats or whatever that are made to shield you from the sun. Uh, that would be what people would wear when they walk. So it's a it's a lifestyle thing. It's a lifestyle choice that a lot of Koreans make. Yeah, um, because it's not just the mountains, is it? it it's walking around the walking city. Walking in the and, city, and, and, it can be mountains. It could be both. Um, yeah. I have a Korean friend who is very fit. Um, he's never had a weight problem, not that I know, but you know, I'll see his Facebook and it's like, In Wan Sang again, he lives in Sochan, and In Wan Sang again, and mm. you know, he walks here and he walks there, and it's just, that's how he keeps healthy. Mm-hmm. And he's in very good shape. They have outdoor exercise parks and things exercise like this. Parks, they have uh, ladies yes. doing aerobics yes. down by the river. Right. When I go down there, if I run in the morning, they'll all be standing out there doing and aerobics, stretching, and stretching on these free and exercise the, the, bikes. And free exercise. What like are they free, called? You know, turn and so it's a, <laughs> it's 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 lovely, really, isn't it? And, yeah. And and so, where are you? So this is. This is the, the, the memory. We, we asked you to sort of talk about Seoul and, and how you've seen it through right. memory. So my memory is, you know, the, the, the old Seoul, which yeah. is in the side the four gates. And Gangnam is still, I mean, I still joke with myself, uh, say, three weeks, two weeks ago, I went to the Pengnamjun Art Center, which okay. is, <laughs> you know, is very, to me, still very far south <laughs> But it's not really, you know, Koreans laugh at me when I would say that. But, you know, it's like as soon as I get back across the river, I feel like I'm home Mm. Um, still. Mm -hmm. So even on the subway, when I cross the river and I Mm. get back to the north side of the river, I'm home. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So that's the memory part. But then the, the sort of looking at Seoul as a city, Mm. then that means that it has two centers. There's the the north, you know, the old center, in mm-hmm. the four gates, and then there's Gangnam. So it's a city of two centers, but then there are other sub centers. So, in that way, it's different from, say, New York or London, where you have the central London thing, yeah. or you have Manhattan, or yeah. Um, a big fan of Beck Namjoon. Uh, yeah, he, he did yeah. one in the seventies called TV Garden. I think I, TV I can't Garden. Is that's it TV in Garden. The, is that the name the, of it? That's in the Art Center, Beck Namjoon Art Center. It's, TV Garden. It's down there. I need to go and see you that. Go, go see it. Yeah. Where 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 out in the boonies is it? Oh, <laughs> you go past Pangyo, and you know, for me, it's like I, I feel like I need a space suit. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. What what about the Han River? Is 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 the Han River something? I mean, because it's. Uh, does 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 it play a role? I mean, it was. It's it, a that's a great question because I I was invited to give a talk about the Han River at a symposium. Okay. And that's coming up on June 29th, and I kind of I had to do my homework, and you know I'm not a Han River guy, or but they I wrote a column on it, and the people the, I write for that newspaper that's yeah. sponsoring the the Asia Kyungje. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I see your work in that. Yeah. So they're sponsoring this summit, this um, seminar. So they invited me, which I'm very honored to be a part of. But I'm not a Han River guy, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, so yeah, the Han River is interesting, but it's also problematic because it floods. So there are two problems mm-hmm. with the yeah. Han River, mm-hmm. and the one is the flooding. Mm-hmm. Can they do anything about that? Big question mark. Probably yes, but. You know, that's a big engineering project and there are environmental issues. I, so that's a question mark. Can, mm-hmm. the, can something be done about the flooding? Mm-hmm. But the flooding means that it's hard to build around it. It's hard to access it during times of the year. And, you know, it's, it's not like a tiny little cute river that flows through the city. It's a big, wide river. It and wasn't that long ago we saw footage, we saw pictures of People standing on top of their cars in the middle of the Gangnam Junction. Exactly. I believe it was. And it was, yeah. So it there's causes a huge, huge impact. Yeah. You, there's a safety issue, yeah. and then, but more than the flooding. I mean, because that's a short time. I mean, it's yeah. like the summer. Mm-hmm. But the then there's the roads and the, you know, the highways. Oh, the, the ones underneath. The ones underneath. Yeah. But no. the, the the highway, the Olympic Dero on the south side, and then the big. So there are these eight lane, I don't know how many lanes there are, but I mean, they're like big multi-lane highways. Yeah. 
And you've either got to go over them or you've got to go under them, but they make this huge barrier between the place where people live mm -hmm. and the Han River. So accessing mm. it is not so easy. Mm. It's not like this cute little river where you walk and, you know. So how to, yeah, how to deal with the traffic, how to deal with the access is an issue as far as making it more of a, a place for people to play. Mm -hmm. Of course, Seoul isn't the only city with this problem. A lot of cities have put highways by water because that's an easy place to put a highway because you don't have to tear anything down. Mm -hmm. So New York has highways all around Manhattan, right, um, for the similar same reason. Mm. Could they put the roads underground? Perhaps yes. Could, you know, so there's a lot of things that maybe some engineering could be done to improve access. So, mm. Yeah, be interesting to see what they do with it as their technologies and capabilities improve. And yes, I yeah. wouldn't put anything past the Koreans for, right. for what they can do with it. But that, of course, links into the greenery thing because if you're if you think of oh let's we're you know let's keep adding more green space to Seoul. We've done this. We've done mm -hmm. that. We've done this river stream. You know. We've we've made a walk along this stream or whatever, the Han River is your kind of it's kind of a blue ocean for that. Yeah. How do we get the Han River to be greener and more uh, accessible to people? So. It looks beautiful at the right time of day oh, when, you, when you're crossing yeah, over it, or yeah. you, you, you get the sunset, and you know. So, I think they're going to get it over time. It's just they've got to deal with more than the flooding. I think the traffic is a problem. Mm hmm. Um. Traffic is something in Seoul. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got I mean, the right you know, idea. Those walking highways, about, yeah. and there's noise, and there's pollution, and it's mm -hmm. not necessarily the place you want to. You know, if the highway is the, where it's really close to the Han River, there mm -hmm. there are places in Yoido where it's not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. So that that's why the Yoido Park is the most popular place because it's further from the traffic, but. My, I think they'll get it over time. They will. My father-in-law, their previous place, they, after about 25 years, they moved out of their place in Yoido, but they would, they would hate the cherry blossoms and firework festivals because so many people would descend yes, upon yes, Yoido right. and leave coffee cups litter, uh, lining the streets lining because the there's streets, no traffic, uh, yeah. there's no, sorry, dustbins here yeah. to put things in. Um, in uh, so aside from the river, river, we talked a little bit earlier about... Um, non-Korean born population. Now you've you've also been doing some work apart from your Han right, River work right. on on what would you how would you describe these areas of the city? Well they're sort of migrant neighbor I don't want to say neighborhoods, but areas where a lot of migrants live. Okay. Uh, Im immigrants is another word, but migrants, you know, because they don't always stay, depending on the type of visa that people have. Mm -hmm. But um, migrant areas, so there's Tebangdong, which is um, uh, um, Tedimdong, sorry, uh, Tedimdong, which mm. is uh, has a lot of uh, Korean uh, Chinese ethnic Koreans from China. Is that like Josunjok? Josunjok, yep. yeah, yep. and then Chinese, and that if you go there, it's sort of like a Chinatown, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not sort of, it's really a Chinatown, and that's one. And then there, outside of Seoul, there's Ansan, and near Pusan, there's some um, Kimhae, an older part of Kimhae has a lot of. Mm -hmm. foreigners and foreign migrants, foreign workers. What do, what do Ansan and Kimhae, do they, is it sort of Chosunjok or Chinese no, people? No, it's or is a, it very diverse. There are a lot of people from, you know, Muslim people, mm -hmm. maybe Bangladesh perhaps, Pakistan probably. Mm -hmm. um, Central Asia, of course, is, a, you know, a lot of people from Central Asia. So different groups. Mm. So some of these migrant communities have different groups mm -hmm. and some have one dominant group. Um, so it kind of depends on the the place and the mm -hmm. population in each group. But what's interesting is when you get the different groups, then you have what is the common language and how do people communicate. And the, the so there's, is it Korean? It's usually Korean, but not always, sometimes English or sometimes both. Mm -hmm. So you have Korean and English being the kind of common language among people. Yeah. Um, and in a place, say, uh, where you have like uh, Tedimdong, which is mostly Chinese, then mm -hmm. Chinese becomes the dominant language. So the language is interesting in that, you know, what is the common language in a multilingual place in Korea? <laughs> Korean and English. But then mm. with Korean, what kind of Korean is spoken? 
So you're talking about Korea, foreigners speaking Korean to each other, non-native mm-hmm. speakers using Korean as a lingua franca, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is a very new phenomenon in Korean history, obviously. Yeah. So how do, how do people, non-native speakers of Korean, how, usually we think, well, when we speak Korean, we're speaking with a native speaker. Either a spouse or a friend, or you know, you, mm. most of the people I speak Korean with are native speakers. Mm-hmm. We're not going to start speaking Korean right now because we have English. Yeah. So, but if you're in a multilingual situation and the most efficient common language is Korean, then both people are going to speak Korean. Mm. So, what's that Korean like? Is an interesting question linguistically. Um, so, can I, can I make two points sure. on this? Uh, one would be when I had um, uh, the previous ambassador. Uh, from New Zealand to Korea. Uh, his name is Philip Turner. Uh, he left uh, He left here about six months ago, but he came in here and he, and he said to me, David, do you know what the, the second most spoken language in the world is? I, th- I believe it was this, this is how he said ah, it. Huh? And I said, uh, Mandarin and Arabic, and I went through all of them and he s- sat there shaking his head at me. Right. He said, no, no, David, it's, uh, it's English as a second language. It's English as a second language. And this blew my mind because I immediately right, right. went and told my students, like, you know, when we do lectures in English, you're speaking this language. And if you speak to you know, somebody from Japan, you speak to somebody from France, somebody from Sweden, I've got all these students from all over the world. Right. And they're all using English and they all understand each other. Right. They're not worried if they drop an article or a preposition or care. something like this. No. Because, and they get on. And, they get and on. all yeah. of a sudden there was this epiphany to many people. It's, I don't have to speak perfectly. Yes. They just had to right. get across. And I went with, I, I, I'm not trying to name drop here. This is not a name drop. Do you know Stephen Epstein? Yes, yes. I'm not sure if I pronounced yes. his surname wrong. Yeah. Epstein, Epstein. Um, we went down to Dongdaemun together to uh, to eat some Russian Uzbek food. Yes, yes. And yeah. uh, we were in a restaurant there and we had to speak Korean to the, to the Uzbekistan people right, because right. they didn't speak English. Right. And yeah. I didn't speak Uzbek. Right. Of course, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen did. And he started talking to them in Russian and then Uzbekistan and right, every right. other language that, that he knows. But there we were in Dongdaemun speaking Korean to, you know, right. essentially other white people. But it was it was this fabulous experience. Fabulous experience, yeah. It's interesting. And when I last year I went to Kime, Kime, the place where the migrant community is. And I mm. went to this Turkish, I found this Turkish restaurant and they had baklava, which I, I'd just been to Turkey you mm-hmm. know, a month earlier, and I'm like, baklava, oh my God, I need that right now. So I went in, and you know, it was a Turkish chef and an Uzbekistan, Arubayt, you know, Uzbekistan <laughs> guy who was uh, Alba Singh. Yeah. And he wanted to speak English with me. I, I started speaking in Korean because mm-hmm. I thought, well, he's prob- they probably speak better Korean than English. And then he yeah. answered in English. And it turned out he had studied, his, he was an English major in Uzbekistan, but was studying business administration in Busan. And this was his part-time job. Wow. So he, he, he was better in English than he was in Korean. Mm-hmm. And he spoke Turkish with the chef, but the chef didn't speak any English and the chef spoke Korean with me. <laughs> so I said, I love your baklava and I want some more to take home because I need it tomorrow morning. And, you know, I, that was, you know, it, I complimented the chef in Korean. Yeah. And the, so you had these mix of languages going on. And while I was there... Somebody from I, maybe Pakistan or mm-hmm. you know uh, South Asian came in and spoke mm-hmm. English, mm-hmm. and then a Korean person came in and spoke Korean. You know, so you had this kind of interesting mix of languages. So it's um, it's kind of it's developing, it's spreading. We think well, non-native speakers only speak Korean with Koreans, mm. but it's actually starting to change. So that means. Korean as a lingua franca, what characteristics does it have? And are you one of the quite fascinating? We're we're going on to the subject of Korean language here. And for those of people that don't know, I'm sure many will, but you've written to date four books in Korean. Five. Five, five, I beg I beg your pardon. I'm sorry for underselling you. (laughs) But (laughs) <laughs> Full books in Korean, not not translated, but written in written Korean, in Korean, published yes. in Korean. You also write Korean columns, and I regularly, I sometimes study those with my teacher, and I say, let's let's talk about this one today, please, teacher. And uh, it inspires me that that's what I want to be doing. Right, there is yeah. this perhaps 
I don't know whether this is the right thing to say, but what I notice among some of my students, especially those from, I'm not sure of the correct word, from from the Stans, the Kazakhstans, the Uzbekistans. Right, right. The, also, if we go into my students from China, Japan, they speak Korean very well. Yes, yes. And and sometimes yeah. it's the white guys like me or like that right. don't always necessarily have the Korean skills. Right, right. It might be changing, but you definitely do. I mean, can we perhaps explore some of this Korean language and, and, and what it means to speak it and what type of people speak it. And right, okay. Um, some of that is the language closeness because Kazakh and all these languages have a grammatical relationship. I don't know if they have a grammatical relationship with Korean, mm -hmm. but the grammatical system is similar. Okay. Verbing, endings, agglutinating verbs at the end where you change verb, you know, you add different things. Agglutinating yeah. verb. Agglutinating verb is where you add these different things and it changes the meaning of the verb. That's a nerdy linguistic term. Um, I, I still don't understand. I'm sorry. I, I want to, because I know glutes. <laughs> oh, okay. My um, so so you have like hada and yeah. hada becomes hitta and, you know, you, you change the end of the verb, but you can keep adding different parts. So you have... Hekketjo, right? Hekketjo. Uh, you have different hit. morphemes that are piled up at the end that, you know, give okay. it. That's an agglutinating verb. Um, so though that's the Turkish and all these languages have that. So that's why they it, it, it's easier for them to mm. learn. Chinese, Japanese people, of course, have the vocabulary from Chinese characters. Mm. So they have an advantage. Um, but I think... One thing for Westerners or anybody learning Korean, you know, or any language is you have to decide, okay, I'm not going to be a native speaker, but I'm not going to use that as an excuse to not try. Mm. You want to try. You want to speak as best you can, but you don't want the native speaker to be your goal. Mm. So I've never had this idea like I want to sound just like Koreans. And I often find it a little bit awkward when some Korean person, I mean, they'll tell me, oh, you speak just like a Korean. And I, I smile, but I, <laughs> and part of me is like, actually, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, but I don't. And I don't really want to. And when I think of, say, how my Korean friends are people the same age, Koreans I know who are about my same, the same age, I don't mm. speak Korean like them. I don't want to, you know. I, Where are the differences? Is it pronunciation? Is it's, it, it, well, uh, pronunciation is uh, an obvious thing, but that's actually very superficial. It's yeah. just I want to speak Korean like an educated foreigner. <laughs> what a lovely thing. I don't Please. want to speak Korean like a 61-year-old ajushi. Yeah. I want to speak Korean like an educated foreigner. So if it's a little bit more formal, so I tend to err on the formal side, mm -hmm. which mm. I kind of like because that makes me feel better about myself, that I'm, I'm being maybe polite, maybe, mm -hmm. you, know, I'm not make, you know, I'm not being too casual or informal. And always better to be polite and show respect. So, you know, that I, I don't want to speak Korean like a Korean I want to speak Korean like an educated foreigner, but more than that, I want to speak Korean for doing what I want to do here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. I think one thing that people who learn languages, you have to, why do you want to learn this language? What do you want to do with it? Mm -hmm. So if you have the goal of I want to do X, Y, or and Z with this language, mm -hmm. then that should be your goal, not some sort of standard of perfection or worrying about sounding like a native speaker it's there's a little bit of that with a you know korean like uh, you know your, your your model is the native speaker yeah, yeah but actually you don't need to sound like a native speaker you need to communicate or you need to sound like you want to sound or, right. or your goal and, and especially with your your career your profession and what you do right. i think it's important to have that level of Formality, eloquence. Eloquence, formality, maybe a little distance, but that's in the eye of the beholder. But mm -hmm. I don't want to sound like a casual 61-year-old chummy ajoshi that mm -hmm. you would meet in the street. Mm. I, that it's, I just don't feel comfortable that way. Mm -hmm. So I want to sound like a, you know, educated foreigner. Um, a, a lot of Europeans who speak English have... The, there's, it's called the foreigner's language mm -hmm. thing. In, in, in Europe, that was a topic of discussion for a while when the ESL boom was happening mm. in the UK. And, you know, the, uh, the, so the, the idea is that you, you, you don't want to sound like a native speaker because you're not. Mm -hmm. And so you want to sound like 
a foreigner, but that's okay. Yeah. So a lot of Europeans who speak English, a little more formal than the native speakers, but it's fine, and they have full careers. They use English for entire careers, and you know mm-hmm. nobody cares. N- nobody cares. They 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 have an accent when they, they have speak, an accent. and they, they they will drop articles. Or... Yeah, but nobody cares because they have their careers, and it's the contents that matter. Yeah. Not whether you sounds like Henry Kissinger or not, you know? So, <laughs> That's quite a good impression. Yeah, um, you know, you, so it's the contents that matter. Does does the form something, what's it like writing and publishing and going on these shows and doing everything that you do in Korean? Because as I was preparing for this, and I, I was looking at some of your Korean language interviews and things right, like right, this, and right. a lot of the comments underneath the articles and the YouTube television appearances and podcast appearances that you've done, a lot of the comments were just like, wow, this guy speaks Korean so well. And there was, there seemed to be sort of a focus on the form, the, form, the delivery, right. rather than the content. So I, I'm just curious when you're, because it's, most of my work at the moment is out there in English. It right. is a goal right. of mine to finally transcend this a little bit more regularly, mm-hmm. although I do it sporadically. What's it like having your work out there in Korean? Well, I, I, so that I don't worry about, you know, the pronunciation or I get all, you know, you don't want to get all nervous because Korean's a foreign language for me, right? Right now I'm speaking English and having a great time. It's a lot easier <laughs> with Korean. It's, you know, hello, somebody, I've got to think. And you know, it's a foreign language, right? Uh, I'm not a native speaker, so it, there's a burden, more work involved. Um, so when I'm interviewed in Korean or I just focus on the contents and I just, I just let it, I can't, I just say I'm going to focus on the contents mm. I, and, and that's it. Mm. So I try to, focus on what I want to say and sometimes that also requires some work because some what I want to say is not the, in the question or the question is making an assumption about something else that's not really <laughs> what I so I have to sometimes go through the mm. steps of trying to reframe the discussion mm-hmm. um, so that's what I focus on and um, don't I don't worry about the but, for example, if I do a podcast and I make a mistake in pronunciation, I'll just repeat it and they edit it out and yeah. nobody knows. So that's why you get the good comments <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> um, can, you, can you teach us something in Korean? Because I know this is a weird thing and I've never done this on any of my podcasts, but I don't often always get to sit next to people with your ability. But in some of your columns, you right. will address some of the nuances in the way in which the Korean language is changing. Yes, yes. Uh, or you'll address some of the terms uh, that are being used to differentiate different types of voters or different people in society. Right. Some of these verb endings. And, and so you're known, I, I'm not making this up, but you're known as somebody that has this understanding or that you do focus on some of the nuances Nuances. Right, so right. I'm not sure how successful this will be, but can you can you teach us something or something that's interesting oh, okay. you in, um, in Korean at the moment? Right. Well, the, the, all that that writing is the Hungary column, mm-hmm. which I, I, I I've been writing a Hungary a column for the Hungary Shimun. It's I think the one that just came out is the 39th column. So that's more than three years. So, how many how many columns are you writing? Is it because you do you do I the do Asia Kyungje, do two for them. And I do the Hungary, that's three, and then I do the Korea Herald. Yeah. And sometimes I get invited to do one shots for some other places. So Bravo, uh, sir. Yeah. So um but the Hungary column, the title in Korean is Sawe Sawe Ono. So Languages of Society, which did you know, the reporter and I kind of went back and forth a lot on emails to come up with that. <laughs> um so the point of that is how language reflects society. So sometimes I write about English, but about Korean, mm. I you know focus on language change, my feelings, inklings I get about things. Um, one of the most popular columns, and I kind of knew it would be when I wrote it, but I wrote it anyway. You know, was when I uh, raised the issue of why. When Yoon Sung Yeol was elected, Yoon mm. Sung Yeol was elected president. They called him in the media. He was known as Tang Son In. Mm. Tang Son In. Yeah. Why not Tang Son Ja? 
And when I lived in Korea, you know, go back to the 87 election or the next one five years later, 92, mm. Kim Dae-jung, 97, the winner was referred to as Tang Son Ja. Mm. So why did Ja change to In? Because both of those would mean people, like people. Hak Ja. Yeah. Hak ja. Or the, the so in, you have Hak Ja, yeah. or you have, you know, yeah. right, Weigugin, and you have um, Nodong Ja. You have, so both are acceptable. Mm. And it doesn't really matter which one you use. Um, but the problem for me was the change. Mm -hmm. So why the change from Ja to In? Mm -hmm. And I suggested that, that it, it, it turned out that Im Myung Bak, when he won, wanted sent a memo out to the media saying yeah. that he wanted the word uh, Tang Son In to be used rather than Tang Son Ja. And the media cooperated. And why did that? Because Ja has this sort of... Labor? La not labor, but sort of... Negative image, mm. um, you know, perhaps, but it's used all the time, you know, mm. right? Yeah. Hakja. That's you know, the first one that came to my mind. Um, yeah. You know, so, and, and even if it did have a slightly negative image, mm. the media following what Im Young Bak wanted to do is a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. It would be, so I raised that issue and wrote about that in one of the columns and got lots of clicks and, you know, the whole thing. So... <laughs> <laughs> what was the response? The Imagine. response from the newspaper was, I mean, they they ran it, and they we I have a good relationship with them. So they mm. if they didn't if they thought it was really off the off the wall, they would have told me. Yeah, because um, it's dealing with linguistic competence. In other words, part of my argument was also that Tang Son In sounds unnatural to me. Mm -hmm. Tang Son Ja just sounds more natural. That's the way that comes. Um, and. A lot of Koreans I've spoken to also said the same thing, you know, mm. that this is a flow issue or just a, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah, but that it was interesting to see the response, and a lot of people agreed. And Hangire, of course, which I didn't know when I wrote it, they didn't use Tang Son Ja. I mean, Tang Son In. They used Tang Son Ja anyway. So Hungary never followed that. There's a bit of a politics, I, I would imagine, and going I, in there. I purposely didn't check when yeah. I wrote the column uh, because I didn't want to, you know. Uh, when President Moon... So there's a little bit of politics involved, but yeah. it's just kind of interesting. Like why, when there's a change, what causes the change is, an, is what the question I was trying to deal with. The, the president demanding well, that the media follow, follow this. you know, and it's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then another one that I wrote that also got a lot of clicks was the Hada Dueda thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, you yes. have like a Sengak Hada mm. and then Sengak Dueda. Mm. And... I uh, kind of picked on the point of that, you know, recently I've seen more singak dueda. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that in English? Um, be thought as, like, rather than I think, mm. uh, which would be singak hada, mm. you know, singak dueda might be, it can be thought as. It's, a, it's more passive. It's more passive. Yeah. No. It's more passive. Um, but it's become quite common. And so I was thinking, well, why is this common? Like, you know, in the, uh, back in the day, you might see more Sengak Hada mm. than Sengak Dueda. Why has this become more common? And it's, I kind of came up with the explanation that it's the idea of not wanting to go out on a limb with your thoughts, that you want to, you know, kind of keep that, um, keep yourself down or you want to have less of a presence in ownership of the thought perhaps yes. because that may be the owner owning a thought may be more controversial than you wish and you want to avoid that controversy or the blowback that you might get from coming out strongly with a certain idea so um, that that was very well received that column i thought it would be a bomb i thought it would get no clicks nothing mm. you know because it's kind of esoteric and, and you know it wasn't <laughs> it got lots of clicks so sometimes you don't know with the language columns, right? Mm. You don't, you know, sometimes you pick on something and you think nobody's going to like it or read it because it's kind of strange. But those sometimes get a lot of clicks. But here's a guy from Ann Arbor writing about changes in the Korean, <laughs> Korean language, language in yeah. Korean to Korean people and yeah. um, publishing it in. I mean, do you, ever, do you ever stop and sit and think that's, that's quite a weird thing to be well done? Like, do you ever stop and think about yeah. what you're doing in that? Because it's it's it, rather do. an unusual thing. It's but, a rather yeah. unusual thing, and I, I it's I, beautiful. I, I do, and, and when I do stop and think about it, mm. it's kind of like this strange feeling. Like, 
all the clicks or the likes or whatever they are or the positive mm-hmm. feedback. I mean, you, you will get some criticism, of course. Yeah, That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like I feel like it's sort of like I'm a member of a family. Mm-hmm. Or like I have this, I have these friends, <laughs> these reader friends. Yeah. I don't know who they are. I mean, it's like, on Facebook, it'll come up. You know, I'll see the per, the the you know. Mm. But yeah, it's kind of an honor. I feel quite honored and humbled in a way, but also honored and kind of mm. that I have this connection with people who I don't know. Who, yeah, it's it's a it's a lovely thing. I, I feel quite humbled. It's that's a lovely reaction to have to those things because it keeps you. Uh, working hard, or it keeps you on the ball. You, you right, don't right. you don't take things for granted, or rest on your laurels. Right. Um, yes. I I can't remember where I came across it, but they were talking about the emotional distance that occurs when communicating in a second language. Uh, and I noticed this amongst, uh, I, I get in trouble for saying this, but my, my wife will uh, swear quite readily in English. Right. She's very formal in Korean. Right. She would, I've never heard her utter a swear word in Korean. Right. In English, she'll happily go, oh, shit. And it will come out and there's this, and I, I looked at that and then I also realized that in Korean, I'm very comfortable talking about politics and North Korea and, gen- and all of these, what might be considered controversial or, or, or touchy subjects. And right. I'm, I'm with my Korean teacher all the time, like, let's talk about feminism today and right, like, the right. LGBT community right, and things right, like this. Right. and. My lovely teacher, she's probably sitting there going, David, these are a bit close to the bone. But there is this idea of a an emotional distance that occurs when you're using a second language that allows you to address. I'm not sure. Have you? Yes. Um, that that yeah. There there is that school of thought. Um, you know that you have this emotional distance, and therefore you can deal with touchier subjects. And the reverse can be true, too, that you're afraid of making a mistake or afraid Mm. of offending somebody or not comfortable or secure enough so that you don't talk about things in a second language. It it could be related to linguistic ability. Mm. could be related to your own, you know, uh, who who your interlocutor is, who who you're speaking with. Um, so there's a lot of complicated factors, but definitely that's there. Um, and of course, you know that there's self censorship in Korea, but there's also self censorship that you do. Say, I would do in the United States. Yeah, speaking English in the yep. United States, self censorship. But I also do it here. Mm-hmm. It's different. The contents are different, perhaps some overlap, but they're different. Mm. Um, so there, there's that element too that. It may seem like you're being a little more honest in Korean or open because of that distance, but you are also doing some self-censorship here, as you would in English. Yeah, yeah, it is important to self-censor. The filters, filters do and it, help. And it, it, it's not a bad thing. I mean, we do it yeah. all the time. People mm. think, oh, well, it's, the, it's this age, you know, or that people before... You know, there's something about this age is, you know, we all have to self-censorship, but mm. we've all self-censorship way back, you know. I mean, it's that's the filter of how you, you know, you're managing your self-presentation through language. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure if you will probably never use this term, but I, I used this when I was playing uh, football last week with my team. I play with a team full of Koreans and... Uh, Jeho, who's my partner in the center of defense, he he said to me, David, you, you're playing well today. And I said, yeah, Mada. And right. Have you come across this expression yet? No. Pom is, is, is just form. Okay. Michotta. Your form is crazy. Crazy. Okay. So it just means you're crushing it at you're the moment. You're crushing it. Yes. And when I said that, because I, I'd, I'd heard it and I tested it on him. Right. So I, I test these expressions. And he just looked at me and he just started. But he, he, he always wanted to come up and shake my hand. I'm like, we're playing football. Go and get that guy. Like, just don't yeah, congratulate yeah, 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 yeah. me yet. But I, I also dropped it in class the other day. And I love seeing the reaction sometimes of yes, people yes. Uh, when you do things. And it might yeah. be something like that. When I was filling up my car the other day, the guy said to me, uh, you speak Korean reasonably well. And I said, thank you very much. And he said, it's it's difficult, isn't it? I said, no, it's not difficult. And he just looked at me. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I like yeah. just dropping these little, like, uh, is a more formal expression. Formal expression absolutely. Yes, but yeah. I like, I, 
I, I don't do it flippantly, but I do like seeing people's reactions. When I do can. that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just for fun sometimes, you know. And yeah. 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 Kind of play. Yeah. It's kind of fun. It is. And yeah. it, it allows, I think, um, a, does it allow, you're a linguist, does it allow a greater understanding, a different understanding? Because there is this idea that, you know, if you don't speak our language, go home. And and that seems a bit uncomfortable. Right. Right. Yeah. We, but is there an idea that the more of the language you know, the more of the people, the more of the culture you get to know? That's a common idea. Um, and I'm not sure how that works because, you know, you can... How important is the language to understanding the people? Is, yeah. the, the older I get, I kind of have more questions about that because, um, I mean, it's very important, obviously. Mm. But you, it, there are people who don't like languages. There mm -hmm. are people who don't want to learn them. There are people who, uh, you know, I, in Japan, I knew people who uh, married to Japanese people who just, you know, they... They found it difficult. I mean, Japanese has all those Chinese characters you've got to memorize. They didn't want to learn how to read Japanese because mm -hmm. that's not where their brain is. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. It doesn't mean they're less considerate of Japan or less understanding than somebody who digs right in and, you know, learns 3,000 Chinese characters or whatever. Mm. So I'm not I, – I kind of have some – the idea of, oh, well, you know, if you're going to really understand the culture, you need – the culture, mm -hmm. you need to learn the language is a little bit not 100 percent because there are plenty of people who – you could argue the other way, you know, plenty of people who know the language mm -hmm. and use the language, but they're not necessarily culturally sensitive or interested or there are all kinds of factors. So that's something that's changing with age. Do you think like you're going away I, from the importance of language? Right, because I'm I think it's that. a I'm going a little bit away from the importance of language because mm. I think some of it's an attitude thing. How much do you want to learn and do mm. you need the language to do the learning? Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm. you know, you, so sometimes so I think that the language is very important. It's, I mean, it's a tool. It's it's something that helps you get an insight into the culture, mm. the culture. There are many cultures, right, in Korea. So it helps you get an insight, but I don't think it's an end game. I think it's part of it, but I don't think it's necessarily – I think a lot of it's attitude. Mm -hmm. yeah, and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's not the be all and end all to yeah, have the language. Have it the can language. be something else. Just before we come to this, perhaps the final, you keep doing um, culture in, I'm not sure what we call these speech marks, rabbit ears, things like yes, this. Yes, yes. There's no such thing as Korean. You seem skeptical or, I'm skeptical or, or about because this idea of Korean culture existing. Then you have the culture and it's yeah. this sort of monolithic, monolithic Korea mm. and, you know, the Koreans or the national character, or all this crazy stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's uh, there are different Korean cultures. There are different mm. cultural characteristics of mm. Koreans. They, uh, I, but I think sort of I don't like the culture because it implies a monolithical mm. um, entity that really doesn't exist. Because if you have, I have a friend who mm. runs a cafe in Incheon, for example, and he's. Uh, about 70, a little over 70 now. But, you know, I went to the cafe last time I was here mm. last fall and talked to him. And he just said to me, most of my friends are Taegukki people, you know, the, the people who are, mm. uh, were against the Park Geun-hye impeachment. Mm -hmm. Park Samo, sometimes Park they're called. Samo, yeah. Um, you know, that group. And, the, yeah. you know, and I'm like, really? Yeah. He's like, yeah. You know, and it's like, I said, why? You know, because he's very politically progressive. And, mm. you know, so... Why? And he said, well, you know, they're they're kind of ignored at home and they don't they, they want to go out and they want to socialize. Yeah, so just, I can see that you have these yeah. older people who are somehow perhaps alienated from what's going on in Korea now. I, mm. You know, and they they go in outside on Saturday and they have their little taeguki demonstrations. There's that Korea, and then there's all kinds of, you know, then there's the, I mean, there's a range of Korean people. There's not the culture. Mm. I, uh, I love that definition. I, I love that explanation of it. All Korea, the, there are some aspects, in, in some certain aspects, all Koreans are like all other Koreans. 
in some certain aspects they're, they're just like Not some a, other Koreans yeah, yeah. and sometimes they're just that individual and right, when you right. see Korean people doing something you're like is that just because they're that person is that that's that a certain culture or or reflecting or that that age group yeah. or that or some background or is it you know so it's it, once you start getting into the culture or, you know or then you're getting into the we Japanese territory so <laughs> you know there's no we Japanese or we Koreans there's yeah. Because there's a lot of diversity of thought, and there are a lot of, you know, there's the there are different religious beliefs in Korea. There's the yeah. generations. There's yeah. urban, rural. You know, so I think it's important to remember that not every Korean is the same as every other Korean. Does Han ex- <laughs> goes without saying? But <laughs> does Han exist amongst the Koreans? This is this is quite a little bombshell that yeah, I just dropped um, on you. But Han is one of those topics. Yeah, um, that is you know. It's considered a Korean a Korean trait. Yes, um, it's this sense of uh, there might be some people listening that have never heard of Han, Han before. It's um, a sense of sadness, bittersweet, bittersweet sadness. There's a bittersweet kind of element to it. Smoldering I think. resentment. Some people call it. Um, <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of different ways to look at it. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, it may have existed for the older generations mm. that we were, say, were, that I was talking about, say, the people who came of age during the industrialization boom and yes. went through poverty after the Korean War. And, you know, um, but younger people, 20 something running around Hongdae, does Han exist? I don't think so. I don't know. I would wager <laughs> probably not. Right. Um, so then if you say, well, Han is a characteristic of Koreans and you run around, you know, Yontro Park or Hongdae and younger Koreans, they don't have those kind of experiences. No. Um, Yon- yeah, it's not. Maybe it's a, yeah, I, I think it's sort of difficult to start running around saying Han is this mythological sort of humongous Korean cultural trait uh, mm. it, it may be for some people but not for everybody i dare you to write that column sir yes. in <laughs> korean <laughs> <laughs> i i asked my uh, my nephew about it who who is kosam he's just yes. doing his yes. uh sunung in november and i asked him in front of a, a full lecture hall actually right. and he spoke in english and he said uh that um he understands it academically Right. He understands it when he has to study poems and munhak and literature. Right. He can, and he's taught what it is. He yes. can recite Han, but what he he doesn't feel yeah, Han. He, do, he doesn't right. live Han. He doesn't live it. That's right. So it could be, say, then something about, say, oh, you know, um, a, a sensibility that somebody in the UK or the United States may be taught about culture. My mind but immediately went to sin. And no, I, I don't mean to equate Han and Sin, but I'm just trying to think of Sin or um, where yes. Sin is. You can understand it academically and theologically, theologically and, it's, and it, it's part in that culture. Is whereas you might not really sort of know Sin. You might think of in different terms or morals or ethics or things right. like this. So you understand Sin theoretically, but you don't feel yourself. Oh, I just sinned. I just sinned, or I need yeah. to confess, or I need Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, some religious. Yeah, so it it could be something like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that you, this was your nephew. My nephew, yeah, your nephew. Okay, yeah, yeah. and that, and how old is he? Seven, uh, seventeen. He's 17? Gosa, he, I yeah. get confused with ages. He's doing his sunung, so that's Gosam. But, yeah. but around that age, yeah. yeah. So he can, um, and you would find. I mean, he would find Han in the literature that he would find Han in the literature that he. Had studied in school and yeah. pre- probably a good student, so he, you know, absorbed what he was taught. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean he feels it in his daily life. Yeah. So I think that's that underscores the point. And and the next generation will write new literature and they will be bringing Could things be handless, <laughs> <laughs> handless in Hanguk or yeah, something. Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a new drama coming out. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, is there Should, any? I'm going to go to the. Wait, do, well, I was just about to wrap this up. No, please, if you would like to go to the go. bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we can, yeah, we've, we've got a little bit more to go. Sure, sure, please take your time. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. We've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. Hey. I want to start with Kiri's. What I want to start with here is, is there anything that you find that people misunderstand about Korea? Perhaps when 
you're in the United States when you're <coughs> right. in Germany and you know you you say to people oh I, I, I'm going to Korea or I speak Korean is right. there any common misunderstandings misperceptions that you experience are there things that people are sleeping on that they're not quite grasping about this country or right that's a great question I think it depends who you talk to mm -hmm. um, but overall I think say there's this k-pop and this hallyu but the k-pop thing mm. is viewed i mean that's that's one thing mm. but then there's korea south korea republic of korea as a country and so i think one of the biggest misunderstandings is people don't still don't see south korea republic of korea as a country that is say on par with a spain spain or I mean, you know, 50 million people mm -hmm. developed. Um, so the, that the, the level of development and population and importance in the world economy mm. still doesn't rub off into sort of the status of South Korea as a country. Mm. Um, so but that, it should, perhaps, it should, if you're looking perhaps, at the data. Yes. <laughs> if you're looking the at figures, the data yeah. and that kind of thing. And so, but K-pop isn't necessarily associated with Korea much as the Korean government would love it to be. Mm. I mean, it is, of course, and they're viewed as Koreans, but I think the fandom and all this doesn't have a... There's not necessarily... You don't need to understand what South Korea is to like K-pop. No. 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 So you don't even know... Even don't, you don't have to know where South Korea is. You don't have to know anything about South Korea to deal with K-pop. It's just the singers are Korean, but you don't have to mm. engage or learn any more than, than that. So, yes, I think there's that, um, I mean, you know, Korea could be easily a G8 country. Yeah, you yeah. Know, um, I, I think that also comes from inside the country, I might suggest. Korean people will sometimes tell me we are a small country. Right. And I, I well, you're about the same size of England. <laughs> yeah. The population is pretty similar. I, I, I right. Mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, Japan will, I mean, Japanese people will tell you Japan is small, even though it's thousands of kilometers from Hokkaido down to Okinawa. Mm. Um, I, I think in the case of Korea, that's because the, the long history of having been mm. next to China and then the influence of the United States. So mm -hmm. maybe compared to those countries, Korea isn't very big. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily small or unimportant or not doesn't have the potential to be a player in, in mm. the, on the world stage. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's what I still get. Does does Hallyu help your work does this spread of k-pop the movies the dramas does it have any crossover because i i'm not sure are you a big k-pop fan not really no <laughs> we, we go back to <laughs> i don't mean to say i dislike it or hate it no but yeah, yeah. i'm not a k-pop fan <laughs> that's absolutely fine we all like different things i mean you uh, like we both like bowie right let's go yes. bowie yeah. um does the hallyu have crossover effects for you does it help bring greater attention to your work does it distract from the more important things you're doing with the country itself or how, right. how do those two spheres of influence how do those two universes collide it, they, they're kind of non-relevant okay um, wow for me uh k-pop is just something that i don't write about it very much i mean mm. occasionally i've written about it mostly from a linguistic point of view the mix mm. of languages and things like that yeah but i'm not a fan so i can't really write about it from inside or from mm a position of knowledge so i just kind of let it go mm -hmm. Hallyu, the same thing i mean how you it was a, it kind of really took off in japan and you had these japanese uh middle-aged ladies the the, the <laughs> yunsama the Be Be Young Jun fan clubs yeah. that's that world is not part of me and i'm you know it's it's fine but i just don't deal with it um that doesn't mean i think it's insignificant or doesn't matter i just let other people take care of it. Are you really <laughs> trying to tell me there's not a middle-aged Japanese lady inside you somewhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like I, 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 yeah, I don't see it. You find you. Find yeah. What's I, this is? What, what's the? Is there an equivalent of ajuma in Japanese? Um, yes. there's the word obatarian, which, but that's sort of oba obasan is yeah like uh, ajima, but obatarian is sort of an aggressive Ooh, obasan. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. it's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when we talk about putting Korea on the same level as Spain, when I talk about the future, and I, uh, 
if you Google the word Koreanization, right. A photo oh, of me. A yeah. photo of me and my students will come up. Wow! Okay. Because nobody talks about it really, right. and so I, I've introduced this idea when I say to my students that you, when you come here and you learn about these things, especially to the international students, and you go home, you, you're becoming slowly Koreanized. Some of you, not point one percent. Some of you, five percent. Some of you, ten percent. Yeah. It's it's the way you do your hair. It's the fact that you're willing to leave your phone on a coffee shop table and go away and go right, and order right. career is coming into you in some ways and yes, and you'll yes. be helping to tell this story and push it round and you know the story of career will be written by people other than us as yes. it goes forward and right. i i tell them that and then i also suggest to them that there's this one idea that career could be a symbol of decolonization of resistance of change of a new world order of a, of a thing that right. you know and i have a picture of bong juno kam dok nim there say, saying when you overcome the one inch barrier of subtitles you'll see a whole new world that korea you know the 20th century is done we're in the 21st century right. and we know that different countries rise and fall in influence and things like this right. it's only natural that korea could be a symbol of this thing and when i say that the students kind of get a little bit restless and they sit up in their chair and they, they get excited by this idea and um then i show them the next slider and, <laughs> and i say or it's just a continuation of western hegemony and they're all wearing right. hoodies and they're eating mcdonald's and it's you know it's nothing's changing do you have a sense of the future for korea having seen so much of the past and the journey right. are you able to project what korea does um a little it, it, it's risky but i i think if i were to kind of go out on a limb and project mm. i think the democratization is a key thing because you could argue that korea is the most democratic society in asia and yeah i, I think mean, so you could if you look at a map so who would rival it who would rival it right that's so maybe taiwan but taiwan you know, so you, you, Taiwan is a good challenge. Yeah. Taiwan and Taiwan might be the only rival. It's more democratic than Japan because mm -hmm. it's had many changes of governments. Yeah. Japan has had, you know, so you you so the democracy. But then that's related to the IT. Mm -hmm. So you have these two things that Korea kind of has as in say if we look at Asia. So you have the democracy and the IT. But what does the IT mean? And the IT means. Mm -hmm. um, that it, it reflects a willingness to experiment with what is new at the time. And not all countries have that. Mm. Um, not that I need to tell you that. But so there are a lot of places that are very resistant to change, that fear change, but Korea just embraced this stuff, yeah. IT. So you have the IT and the democratization. Of course, that goes back to the 80s and 90s. But though the willingness mm. to look at the world as it is and go with that mm. is something that Korea has done very well with. Mm. So that the IT but and the democratization. So if you look in the future, then if Korea can keep that open sort of forward looking stance, mm. then Korea could be quite an interesting place for dealing with issues that come up in the 21st century like climate change or um, you know, other social issues, dealing with the issue of immigration, for example. The, you know, we think of immigration as a solution to the low birth rate and the problem, the economic problems that will come with that, but mm -hmm. maybe robots mm -hmm. or a both or a combination. Mm -hmm. And what kind of immigration are you going to have? Um, now we think of immigration to Korea as foreign workers or laborers, unquote, you know, that but you could have IT workers or something in the yes. future. So the combination of people coming to Korea and then different solutions inside Korea could make Korea quite a cutting edge place. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen it twice, you know, the robot deliver my, my dinner. <laughs> and then the, you know, the, the server will take it off the tray that's been oh. delivered by the robot and put it on the table. Um, so that, I, I can see Korea becoming quite cutting edge in terms of offering solutions for problems that are coming up. Yeah. Um, 
But it's that's a little different from, say, Japan in the 1980s, where Japan was, you know, boom, 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 and the Sony Walkman, and Japan was this future country, and it was going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. That that was a little bit, you know, that was a power game thing, mm -hmm. uh, economic power. So the idea that Japan would be overtaking the United States or, you know, this, uh, I'm not talking about economic power necessarily. I'm talking about creative solutions to problems. Yeah. And a willingness to embrace, embrace uh, future possibilities. Future possibilities. Uh -huh. So th that doesn't mean that Korea is going to become the largest economic power yeah. or, you know, so, and it doesn't mean even that Korea might become as rich as, say, Scandinavia or what, but that's another story. But mm. This creative, uh, being able to offer creative and tangible, mm. usable solutions is, I think, uh, where Korea has an edge. Mm -hmm. um, Because it's not just robots that will deliver your food, but you walk into a convenience store, sometimes right. on a campus, and there's no one working there. No one working there, yeah. You just have to scan and do things yourself. yourself. And yeah. th they have a untacked society, which is a, yeah. a god-awful sounding word, I must I must admit, I don't like the sound of it, but they're willing to embrace uh, technology to solve solve problems. And it may be that people don't like it, and that's a problem. But at least there's it's been tried, and you know, so you you have that willingness to embrace a change, a technology, mm. or something to offer a solution. And if that edge can keep rolling, then I think Korea could be make quite a positive influence on the world. Mm. You know. And its democracy is, I mean, it, it's easy to compare it to places in Western Europe or North America, right. but I think you do the 100% correct thing in to say that geography and culture and history matters. This is not a democratic part of the world by any no, stretch of the imagination. No, traditionally not, yeah. Yeah, so. and that's not to say that that's a bad thing, although I do personally prefer having lived in democracies. I love the right. value of them, but if you look at North Korea just above, China, Russia, yes, yes. Japan a little bit less, and Vietnam, right. but this... South Korea proves it can work. And right. In presidential elections, in the debates... You have four or five different candidates from different parties right. standing up there right. and all having a go. And I, I mean, some other yes, countries yes. could have a look at that as an example and say, are you allowed to do that? You're allowed more than two candidates? Wow. Right, right, right. Well, and even things like we, we, we were talking about before, the exercise equipment. Yeah. The exercise equipment along the, in the parks, a lot of that comes from the citizens who live there asking the government to put it in. Mm. So you have this, the local government is also very, that goes back to the Kwangju Biennale or other mm. things that we've talked about, where the local government is also part of the democratization. It's not just the presidential level. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's somebody's listening to what the citizens want, or somebody's kind of thinking of more local needs, and there's a response. Um, so democratization is quite impressive. And I think it's a brave person that goes against the Korean citizens. You don't. You don't. You see, they're yeah. a force that will put you in jail, kick you out. They'll, right. they'll do all sorts. I yes, mean, yes, the, I, so. I think that Korean people are very enfranchised. Enfranchised, they, yes. With their democracy. And even I can vote up to the level of uh, mayor. Okay. I can't vote for president right. because I'm not a naturalized citizen. But um, when I do go and vote, it's so easy. And right, right. They tell yeah. me come in here, and they don't bat an eyelid that some weird white guy is walking in. You know, it's 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 very easy, very open, and they seem to have this uh, <clears throat> engagement. Right. You, know, you do vote. It's a civic like See? duty, I guess. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think they're doing great things here. Actually. Yes. Yeah. I'm very positive about the future for Korea. Me too. Yeah. I, I think if they can keep that edge, and I think they will. Mm. Um, but there's always a risk that they could that the, that the edge could somehow fade away. Mm. Um, mm. You know, countries can go through rough times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm an American, I can tell you. So you know, you have. I mean, I never, for example, my sister and I were talking, you know, about how we never would have imagined mm. before Trump, but even the be, talking about the decline of American democracy. That was not a topic my sister, any American, would have ever talked about. The, I remember the, when George W. Bush was the bad guy. Now he's like the lovable uncle, well, and it went even further yeah, down from yeah. that. You and George how, W. Bush, he, it was never a democracy problem. It was his policies and his, you know, religious right support. Eloquence, and, yeah, intelligence. And, and, you know, that. Yeah. It wasn't like he's, he wants to take away democracy. Uh. But, you know, now you, so, you know, things can unravel in a bad way. 
Um, mm. I don't think they will in Korea, but you know, it's not nothing is guaranteed. So if Korea can keep the forward-looking mm. approach, and I think that's the key point: look forward, not right now, not at the present. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That that will carry things in a positive direction. I wonder if I mean I I used to focus a lot on the critical issues of Korea, but then. I, I noticed over the last couple of years the effects that my my words, my attitudes, my ideas, my research, my exploration was having on the the students at the university. Right. Yeah. Because you're you're teaching. Yes. And they're very responsive to what I say, and they're like, "Oh, okay, so career is," you know, yes, they would, yes. they would go on, and and so I decided. I always like to change things up. Let's let's not go gukbong. Let's not go sort of over patriotic and tell right, stories right. that aren't true. But let's not gaslight the youth and let's not say all's you know going to hell in a handcart. But let's right. try to focus on some positives. And when I did that, the response that I saw from students was was fascinating to me because they yeah. they kind of went with it. And I've been thinking about these ideas of placebos and nocebos. Right, you know, right. that you give people something that doesn't actually work, but you give them the belief or the hope or the idea. Right, right. This is a, you've heard of MBTIs. Yes, I have. Yes, and um, a lot of people do these MBTIs. MBTIs, they're a bit popular these days. They're hugely popular. Yeah. Um, they're asked to submit MBTIs for job applications and internships. Really? Yes. Yes, yes, wow. yes, yes. And so I told my students, if somebody asks you, answer this, what MBTI would you like me to have? That's, what, That's yeah. a good response, That's isn't good it? Response. But what I would like to, I had this thought, which is completely unethical, that when people do MBTI tests, it might come back and say that they're introvert. Right. Because you either get introvert or extrovert. Right. It's Ex binary. That's the first letter that's yeah. given. Yeah. And if people get the introvert, <clears throat> they will immediately think, yeah, see, that's me. That's, that's me. just the way I am. That's the way I am. And then it might make them even more introverted. Right, right. And I would love to lie to these people. Right. I would right. love to give all the introverted people an E. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm the, oh I, I got my life wrong. Right. I'm meant to be outgoing. Right. And it might. And it might actually. <laughs> right. I don't. That's very unethical. But you see the point. I I'm trying point. to get in, yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. in to try to promote um, a, a different way or different possibilities or encouragement. Right. Yeah. It's well, it, 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 you know, if you're it, if you're down on Korea, then that almost becomes a. It, it would have negative impact on your students. Yeah. But you don't need to be, you know, kukbong or you know, completely. So it, it's uh, mm. the balance is important. You could become like a self-fulfilling prophecy self or something like prophecy, that. Um, yes, yes, but I, I yeah. also want I, I want them to rise up. I you know I want one of them to be president one day or something like that. Yeah. You, know, you want, I want them, them to have achieve. confidence. Yeah. You know, young people need confidence. Yeah. You want them to have confidence to go go out into the world, which can sometimes include the school of hard knocks. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't <laughs> molly cuddle them. I, I, I made one poor girl go out and run five kilometers the other day. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm mentoring her, and she's like, "What would you like me to do now? Go and run 5k." And she yeah. looked at me as if to say, uh, no, I can't do that. "You go and do that." And then, what have um, in your sixty odd years? Yes. <laughs> what, what have you learned about life? What do you think that young nineteen, twenty year olds? perhaps need to learn, could learn, if you could speak to a 20-year-old a Robert Fowler today, what wisdom would you give after 60-odd years of life? Is, is there anything that you've gleaned from this Yeah, well, coil? That, that's, a, that's a hard question. I mean, it's a great question. It's a hard question. I think one of the key words that I have in dealing with, you know, thinking about life or mm. what my own life or other people's is, um, say, my, my niece and my nephew, who I love dearly, um, you know, or other young people is, you need to try. You you need a sense of agency, mm. um, and I don't think you know. I think that's hard. It doesn't. Nobody gives it to you. You have to develop it. You have to claim it. You have to work at it. It's not something that's given. It's, but you need to have a a sense of agency that you're the owner of your life, and that may sound like a luxury. Um, you know, somebody who, in my case, I've been. You know, I've had many advantages given to me, and um, I'm very thankful for that. Mm. Um, but it's more than that. It's the idea that you you need to – a sense of agency means that you are the owner of your life and that you have the ability to carve it the way you want. 
Um, you know, and that doesn't always, you don't always get to what you want, but if you don't know what you want, you're not going to get it anyway. Mm. So I think a, a sense of agency is very important, especially for younger people these days where, you know, that that is often difficult for them to develop because there's a lot of conformity and as social media, and, you know, it's, mm. it's a little bit difficult for, so social, a sense of agency is very important. How does one cultivate a sense of agency? So you've already said that for young people it's difficult. But how does what's how the, do you do it? Have um, agency, people. Yes, um, it, like the you you telling the student to run five kilometers. You know, you you do things, hmm. and then you you find that it, that you have a sense of accomplishment from doing different things. So if you're told you can't do things, then you're being in a sense denied agency, right? You're being mm -hmm. told that you can't do this, you can't do that, this isn't for you, mm -hmm. you're you're an introvert or whatever. So you're being told that, you know, you don't you're not in control of your life. So mm -hmm. trying things, doing things. So I think for younger people, um, doing different things, trying different things, rather than just, you know, Having that curiosity and trying different things is the best way to develop agency because in that process, you're going to find out that you like some things and you don't like others. And mm -hmm. You're going to grow with each thing that you do. There's a um, yeah. Korean-born German philosopher called Han Byung-chol. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. Heard the name, but I'm not familiar with this and work. He yeah. talks about that previous societies were defined as should societies. Yes. Whereas you should do this, and if you, you ask your professor, yeah. they will tell you, no, you should study this, and you should do that. And your parents would tell you what you should do, who you should marry. Right. Um, your priest, your rabbi, or your monk will tell you what you should and shouldn't do in terms of morality. Uh, but now it's a can society. And if, if yes. students go to their professor and say, what should I do? What, what, what job should I do? If they go to their parents, they'll say, well, you can do anything. You can do anything. And that you can do anything, Han byung Chol says, is <clears throat> it's very, um, what's the word? It paralyzes people. Because if you can do anything, you end up doing nothing. Right. Because there's sort of, there's this unlimited selection of possibilities that would range from the very... Uh, most uninspired choice to the biggest choice possible. Right. And there's all of not, this choice yes, and it's actually yeah. raising what you're meant to be doing. You know, it's not enough just to work in a post office or the local estate agents or the, the fruit and veg store. If you can do anything, that's surely not enough. Not and enough, so yes, the, yes. These options, Han byung Chol says, is giving people this freedom to do anything actually makes them do It paralyzes far less. them, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's not what I mean. I mean, <coughs> trying different things and mm. is important so that you find out what you want to do. Yeah. Where did you... Uh, mm. You seem so very young. <laughs> I, I, I say this honestly. I, I mean, I, I encounter people of various ages, but you seem so... How have you, how have you managed this? Is there a secret to, <laughs> to, your, to your youth, to your energy, to your optimism? Well, um Part of it is my grandfather. I call it the Grandpa Fowser program. <laughs> <laughs> my sister, I just, to my sister, I yeah, just, yeah, 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 I, yeah. it's the Grandpa Fowser program. Okay. And Grandpa, uh, he was born in 1895, Ooh. and he, you know, he went to the Second World, the First World War, and because he could type, he spent the First World War in Paris. So he had a lot of various different experiences, but he was always learning. Mm. So he always reading, and he. Had, he studied horticulture in college, so he was educated for the time. You mm. know, most people didn't go to college at the time, so he was educated. Um, but he studied horticulture, so he was an avid gardener. Mm. And my grandmother was a very lovely but also demanding ajima. <laughs> so my grandfather's way of dealing with my grandmother was to spend enough time in the garden to keep his sanity. Which was a good thing. Yeah. So yeah. he had the garden, and he had his reading, and he had this sense of inner balance. It's Voltaire, isn't it? It's Candide, you know. cultivate your garden. And the yes. Panglossium. So the Grandpa Fowser program, you know, he was always very chill. Um, what did he have in the garden? You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had in the garden. Uh, yeah, you know, he was always this, you know, this very uh, chill, but also um, optimistic and always learning. Uh, so the Grandpa Fowler program is something that I followed because always keep learning, always yeah. have curiosity. Um, and 
active, you know, gardening is very active. So mm. he, he, and he lived to be 95 years old and was only unhealthy the last couple of years of his life. So he was the Grandpa Fowler program, learn, be active, um, yeah, and, and just keep a positive attitude. Be chill. Be chill. Have a garden. He was very chill, so that yeah. kept him, you know, but uh, also positive and... Yeah. And he was great with me, you know, a, a grand grandson. And mm. He did woodworking too. And, you know, I learned woodworking from my grandfather. I learned gardening, all this stuff that, you know, comes out later in life. Mm. So, you know, I can actually garden a little bit because of what I learned from him. So, does it happen that traits? Uh, this, uh, I asked a student. I asked someone today, "Do you look like your mother or your father?" And she said, "I oh, know my grandmother." There is this idea that things miss a generation. There that, is, yes. That, that, and, I'm not making that up. No, that no. My dad was bald. <laughs> so, <laughs> and my grandfather had his full head of hair all the way until the end. So, you know, yeah, well, that's maybe why that's, the grandpa <laughs> that's, that's the Grandpa Bowser program. Yeah. Uh, so, and he, he was uh, a wonderful person. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Thanks, good. Mr. Fowler. Thank you. Oh, that was good. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I loved it. It, it, was, it was real. Lovely. It was uh, great. Uh, thank you for your time. Let's relax. A good spot to chop right at the end of the grandpa. Well, I, I think so because it's got to, I, I like to get people to Oh, God.